Schön, dass ihr wieder da seid. Ähm, ich begrüße euch zum, zur Abschlussrunde ähm, unserer Tagung. Im Mittelpunkt der Diskussion am, am Ende sollte die Frage stehen, was genau an unseren Praxen das Transformatorische ausmacht, also in so einem Austausch zwischen, äh, um Erfahrungen aus der Praxis zu kommen, was gab es für Versuche, transformatorische Elemente oder Perspektiven in die Arbeit einzubringen, was hat funktioniert und was hat vielleicht auch nicht funktioniert, um sozusagen aus dem Scheitern von Strategien und, ähm, und Versuchen sozusagen zu lernen für die Zukunft. Um, so, to me, I think other people have already talked about transformative organizing fundamentally being about transforming society, but in the process, people are changed in the process of changing the world. Um, and to me, transformative organizing, liberatory organizing, revolutionary organizing is fundamentally about asking people three basic questions. The first is, what's at the root cause of the problems that you're experiencing in your community, in your workplace, or in the world? How could those things be organized so that you and nobody else ever has to deal with those problems ever again? And third, what are you going to do to make that happen? So some organizing models, I think, may be about, well, we're simply going to try to put Band-Aids on fundamental structural problems that exist. And I think transformative, liberatory, revolutionary organizing is about changing structures so that those problems don't exist anymore. Um, in that process, I think I've found we're asking people to do insane things. In some ways, it doesn't make any sense for people to go to meetings, to go to actions, to get arrested by the cops, potentially be beaten over the head when they could be spending time with their families or trying to struggle within capitalism to figure out a way to be able to provide housing and food for their families. We're asking people to take risks And I would say that our responsibility then as revolutionary organizers is to figure out how to chart a path that meets the level of risk that we're asking people to step forward with. So I think all of us are going to have very different experiences, and I'm excited to hear about stuff. What I wanted to do is to put out sort of several categories that power has developed over the course of years of our work. Um, and some of this draws specifically from our experience. Some of this draws from experience of other organizations in the room. And a lot of it actually is drawn from the experience of different liberation movements um, around the globe. So the first component is that all transformative organizing is guided by a vision and a strategy. Um, and other people have talked about this earlier, but in order for us to be able to move beyond just being against everything, and there are a lot of things to be against, it's critical for us to be able to project a clear vision of what it is that we're fighting for. But that vision also gives us a framework, a criteria, to evaluate what are the social forces that we think have a deep-seated interest in fighting for that vision, and what are the social forces that we think we might be able to win over. So then the vision begins to open up clarity about strategy, and that, I think, is the first piece of transformative organizing. The second piece is direct action campaigns. Um, and there, it is this weird notion And it's, I think, a notion that isn't entirely prevalent on the left, because um, it is that we actually begin from people's lived experience. We begin building their capacity to fight to make changes in their lives, in their community, and that that 
process of fighting is both going to make improvements in the world, but it's also going to begin preparing people to take on larger struggles in the future. Right. So for power, a lot of our work begins with just doing outreach. So most recently, we've been sending people out on the buses. People spend at least 12 hours a week talking to people on the buses. And some of that is about beginning to talk about public transportation, but some of that conversation is really about beginning to make the linkages about how it is that public services have been cut and why it is then that people need to join in a fight, not just to restore those public services, but to ultimately be in the position where we get to reclaim the wealth that we've created. So outreach is a, is a core part of uh, campaigns. Developing demands and really trying to be conscious about what the demands are that we're creating. Figuring out what are tactics that we can use and then figuring out ways of building coalitions or united fronts to bring folks together. And one thing, again, that I think differentiates this organizing model from the Alinsky model is that our campaigns, our demands are not always winnable. And I think sometimes we organizationally have taken on fights because we think it's necessary to take on those fights, even though we think we're going to lose. Because in my experience, if we only take on campaigns that we can win, then we're not fighting for what it is that our people deserve. That's one. Two, there are times where the attacks are coming from the right at such a level, it may be that we're going to wind up losing, but oftentimes people are inspired not necessarily just by the prospect of winning, but fighting honestly in their own interests in their own way. And it's important sometimes to just fight, even if you know you're going to get kicked in the teeth. So the third point is cadre development. And we organizationally think about cadre development at three levels. One is ideological, the second is tactical, and the third is practice. Just how it is that we are and how we relate to other people, but also how it is that we then sort of relate to ourselves. And powers try to do that in a lot of different ways. We have political education classes. We have this thing that we've created, Power University. It's a free university. Um, there's no building, but uh, it's a free university. Um, we also have ongoing political discussions, as well as one-on-one -on -one conversations where every leader of the organization has their own leadership development plan. But another key part of our leadership development is political exposures. So in 99, Power wound up sending two members, a staff member and a lead member, up to Seattle to participate in what turned out to be the battle in Seattle, the protests against the WTO. And the member who went, she must have been like 54 at the time, African-American woman, this was her first political activity. Up until then, I'm always sort of a shop steward, um, relatively soft-spoken, um, but she really enjoyed organizing. And you know, she had participated in a lot of power protests where we had like 30 or 40 people going to City Hall, um, chanting and having the sheriffs come and threaten folks with arrest. Um, and Emma was often entirely scared, reasonably scared, by the sheriffs coming in and threatening us. Emma goes to Seattle and comes back an entirely different person. Emma's experience of sort of being on the people's side and seeing the cops run from us rather than us run from the cops completely changed her orientation about what was possible. Now, in as much as we were having demonstrations of 30 or maybe 40 people, it, maybe it didn't make sense for us to be charging the sheriffs, but still Emma began to see something that was possible beyond our individual struggles for workfare workers' rights or public transportation. 
in our experience, building on the experience of Lenin and lots of other organizers after that, it's important for us to be making exposures so that people can make connections and think outside of what they currently think of as possible. The fourth component is translocal alliance and movement building. And by translocal, we mean that a lot of our struggles, a lot of our experiences begin locally, but we want to make the connections. So for us, coming as an organization in San Francisco that's been fighting displacement in the African American community, it's easy to think that we're the only ones who are going through that experience. And then we hear about the comrades in Hamburg who not only are engaged in a very similar struggle, but actually are using the same banner that one of our alliances is a part of. It's important for us to begin making those connections so that folks are developing a sense of possibility that we're not alone. And then finally, um, the last piece that we talk about is preparatory projects. Um, and that really builds on the idea that we're not just trying to change structures, but we're also trying to change ourselves and prepare ourselves to govern. Um, and in a lot of ways, this builds on the insight of Amilcar Cabral and the PIGC and the liberation struggle in Cape Verde, Guinea-Bissau, where after mounting a heroic struggle against the Portuguese colonizers, the PAIGC was in a position militarily to kick the occupying army out of their country. But they decided not to do it at that particular time because they were clear they weren't ready to govern yet. And so for us, we haven't quite built up the capacity to kick the San Francisco police or the National Guard out of San Francisco. But from our steering committee, where the members make the strategic decisions about what campaigns we're working on, to beginning to create community gardens where folks are governing space for themselves, we have to constantly think about how it is that we're developing the capacity for our people not only to fight, but also to govern and organize society in a different way. Um, so those have been some of our experiences, how it is that we're trying to sort of uh, frame it. And for us, the framing is important because it's important for us ultimately to begin seeding new organizing all over the globe. Um, and there are particular sort of successes, I think, that we've experienced, but then also particular weaknesses um, that I definitely want to talk about. But I think for the sake of time, I'll, I'll cut it off now. Thank you very much. We can. Ich bin gebeten worden, noch mal darauf hinzuweisen, dass anders als bisher bei der Tagung jetzt der Raum an sich natürlich auf den Film kommt, wenn wir so sitzen. Und wenn das jemand von euch nicht recht ist, möchte er bitte hinterher am Tisch Bescheid sagen, dann pixeln wir die Gesichter, wenn euch das recht ist. Um, okay, who's next? Maybe. Louise, would you like to share your um, experience? Because Louise was the only one who hasn't spoken before in our round. And would you like me to introduce you um, again? You did it briefly at the first evening, but um, or would you like to do it yourself? What? Would you like to introduce yourself? Or uh, would you yeah. Like to see me? yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm Luis Juberías from Peraldeca Foundation of Catalonia, Spain. Um, and I would like to talk about two experiences and, and the philosophy, the organizing philosophy we have developed uh, in our work. In our work, our foundation is a foundation linked to the Communist Party of Catalonia. That is a party that is institutionalized in institu institutional politics. It's in a coalition, so our foundation is not linked. Uh, directly to institutional politics, okay? Because the, 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 the coalition has its own foundation, so we had to uh, rethink our, ourselves, okay? And we thought uh, our, uh, our aim, our uh, objective was to, to uh, tie, have tight relations with society, experiences, 
and what we try to do is is uh, to to build alliances no and that's uh, as it has been said is about about uh, building relations even personal relations confidence and how we do that we don't go to say okay we are right we have a solution we we know about everything but all the contrary we go to recognize that there are people that are working on on particular issues very well they know about the, about the, about uh, about uh, these things and we want we want to listen to support them and to to have the experience they are our, our people there okay so for example, for example uh, i don't know palestinian issues okay mm. So we ask the Palestinian House, we ask the Palestinian uh, support organizations what they do, why, what they do need, okay, what they do need, how can we help, and then we support, we and we provide uh, resources, experience, and or net because we are speci specialized in anything but in having a, a, a very wide uh, relationship uh, network. Okay, we we know we uh, after after some years we know um, have a, a a lot of information about what is in the, in in social society in Catalonia, and that happens that no that's not that's a knowledge that no not many people have not many organisations because organisations are are uh, are very very attached to their own objectives their own narrow projects. And they don't know about anything else. So we try to 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 have this knowledge and to and to help them to to connect. Uh, and that's uh, and and we and we always work with a, a big generosity and flexibility. That means that we don't want uh, or uh, or um, to be to be the protagonist or to have the 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 logo always the, in the first, uh, no, that many organizations have do that. They want to, to be the protagonist and to have a, their image uh, is the, the, the most important thing. But what we do, do is uh, to stay uh, behind, stay behind, help uh, projects uh, in what we can. And then that's also good for, our, for us as an organization because we have the prestige of the of these organizations no? uh, that's uh, one thing we we um, we learn and that is difficult because most of the organizations that don't understand this flexibility and generosity they want to be the protagonist and to put the their logos and they don't understand they don't understand that that you are doing that and you are do, doing that because because you think it's important just the, the aim, not not the the organization itself, no. And then for then with with this culture, organizational culture, what what we are doing now, okay? Now in in Catalonia, in Spain, you know, there is the the big crisis. Uh, the crisis is is uh, is very important. Forty five percent of the job people. Uh, be, um, Less than 35 years old are unemployed. Okay, um, a lot of precarious people. Uh, cuts in health educational se uh, system. Also, the the the, the re labor relations are, are being reformed unilaterally by the government in in a neoliberal frame. And it was a, a social uprising. The desperate uprising because society felt they were not represented. Okay, they felt that uh, socialist government, social democrat government, ha, uh, have been applying these these policies, uh, only policies uh, that were uh, the austerity policies, and left uh, the left uh, seems is not enough. It's not a possibility that they 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 are going to 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 be in government. And maybe the language, or we don't know, it doesn't connect with majority of the society. And, and there was a social uprising of people that were not organized in any uh, anywhere. 
anywhere, so completely new people. Coming from precarious background or middle and middle class who who now are no longer middle class, okay? So so they they started this movement of the of the squares, okay? But that that's only expression of the movement. The movement began before with with a lot of uh, uh, protests in the in the hospitals and everything, and and now it's uh, it's continuing. Uh, with other fights, and uh, what we have been doing, we we were the, the only part of the so, uh, organized social society in Catalonia, at least, that uh, so we had to be there. We were we were there. We were to the square. We we knew that that something was going to happen because we we know very well what what's moving in the society, and we were there to learn and to support and to try to, to, yeah, to learn, no? So what, what, uh, what's the, the thing, the, the point? The point is that uh, we now, uh, after the squares, uh, organiza organization of these people is doing, for example, in a social center that we built, that is not foundation, but it is a project that came out of experience. Uh, social centers, that is at the new, the new roads, social centers in Barcelona and in Badalona. Um, people who were in the squares are meeting there, and the movement is, is um, it's a, a space so that uh, is um, the, that the, the space organized. You you do. Uh, Build a center and let people to to do their things there. The, the it it's a way of organizing, and then the other the other thing that uh, we learn with this experience, and I think it's important to 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 know is is how the new ten, the new technologies, the um, the internet uh, 2.0 um, gadgets. Are, uh, the, social, the social networks are used in politics for the first time. It, they are very effe effective. We don't completely understand. Nobody does because it's it's ongoing. It's just a few months since it's uh, widely used. It started in, in Tunisia and in Egypt. It, it mixed with the with the traditional union and, and movement that was very strong in Egypt. But it has a real effect, and we at least we didn't understood until uh, it happened in Spain because some people tried to use these tools in Spain and they succeed. And I think um, we have to, to, le to learn about that because it's uh, very powerful. Twitter, with Twitter for example, nowadays uh, Real Democracy Now, that is the, the platform that organizes the movement in Spain, and he's still leading it, uh, has over 100,000 people following it. Okay? And they have a, a, and people, people uh, who are followers also are very influenced by wa what is said by them in the, in, the, in the Twitter. And they can organize a mobilization in, in two, three days, yes, very, very quickly. And people get, invo get involved. Uh, we don't know why. It's psychology, but with uh, internet, but with Facebook, but more, more in, with Twitter, the, there is like a feedback that uh, that uh, makes people feel invo involved, and and it's an orga organizational to tool. No? Because if you throw an idea, you have the feedback of the people and know if it's uh, it's uh, it's common sense or not, and. It, if it will work or not, if you use it with very, with uh, intelligence, it, it it works. And for example, it's also a coordination, a very important coordination tool, and I, I, I will finish with that. Uh, through the, the networks, through, the, through the, the internet pages, for example, UK and CAT, and also in Spain now with the anti-evictions movement, they are coordinating through just a, a web. Okay, you throw, you put an idea on a web, uh, a date, and people organize, organize uh, 
very very cheaply. No. People, I don't know. It works more in 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 Britain. You, I don't know if you know the movement UK and Cat. They ju they made a, an action. Okay, and next day, uh, twenty other cities in in UK reproduced the same action, and nobody knew each other. No, just was the idea, and they throw throw uh, through the through Twitter and Facebook, and a network was organized in, in one day. No, people very different. People from unions, uh, students, activists. In each city was different people, but with same 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 aim and same same campaign. I think it's uh, I don't know. We have to learn about that. It's it's a thing very new, and. I, I re recognize that I was uh, I, I was not very convinced when it all uh, that all began, but but I think it's a powerful tool if we can master it. And yeah, so, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, okay, so uh, I would no, I was asking actually if I may, Leanne, because, and rem try to to. Um, uh, re or ask you, uh, the following speakers, to maybe concentrate on examples. What reflects for you your idea of transformation, and uh, what in what situations or what what's an example for for the things you that worked with your idea of transformation? And I will start to uh, politely remind you of the time now with some kind of noise I'm going to make. So just because you are far, more far away from me now, so I can reach you that well, but I will try to make some signs and just, <laughs> okay. Is that okay? Sure. Um, I was collecting a few things over the last few days. Let me see. Um, actually, I, th I think that the, the example I wanted to draw on that's uniquely out of my experience is because um, I direct a school for organizing. And so in terms of the question of, you know, some people have asked before about intentionality and continuity and, you know, where do organizers come from and how do you know you want to be an organizer? Um, I just wanted to highlight the school itself, actually, as an example, if that's okay, for a couple of minutes. Um, in the United States, we have, relatively speaking, <laughs> um, a pretty big demand for this kind of schooling. It's impossible to get in the university, and most people get it through um, apprenticeship or just internships, lucky enough to get a job in a position, and um, usually you're just sent out to do the job, <laughs> and that's how you learn. But um, for those of you who I hope will get Eric's book, where it breaks down much in much more detail the kinds of um, job descriptions and qualities that we think are important f for learning to do transformative organizing. These are the qualities in job descriptions we try to teach in the school. So um, in the United States, and maybe somebody else could speak to this at some time, there are a whole variety of training programs. Um, but I think um, perhaps similar to what Steve was talking about, about Power University. This is an e actually an effort to be like a graduate school. Um, so we take students from, that apply from all across the country, and um, it's a pretty competitive process. It's a residency program where they come and live with us for six months, up to a year. Um, so they're like on the clock <laughs> for a year. Um, we give them a stipend and they and a bus pass and health insurance, which is a big thing in the United States. But one of the um, 
things that I wanted to talk about, particularly about an aspect of transformation is ideological transformation in organizer education. Um, it's similar maybe to some of the things that were talked about earlier in terms of one on, you know, the work of one-on-one -on -one organizing, but um, I have yet to meet an organizer, no matter how much they were dying to be an organizer and no matter how much they knew they were a revolutionary and were willing to put their life on the line, that when faced with the reality of it said, oh yeah, this is just what I thought it was going to be. <laughs> um, it's, it's really a, uh, involves a, and this is a tribute to all people who are organizers or think they want to organize. I mean, it's like Eric sometimes says, it's like deciding to go to medical school and actually trying to become a brain surgeon. You know, there really, there really is a lot, a lot to know. And um, so, in our case, we use a generative learning model in terms of pedagogy and basically put, this, put the young people in the street in between the people, the buses, and two main um, carefully calculated forms of classroom learning, one of which we call the Organizers' Exchange, which is what Eric's book is based on, which is um, inducing out of daily experiences of organizing the, the theoretical material that you need to know. Now, Eric may go in there knowing, like Socrates, what he hopes um, the students are going to have seen in the street. But the model is that w they theorize from their practice. And then we couple it with another bookend type of learning, which is basically called problems of imperialism. So those people who are lucky enough to come to this school come not, not because um, they want to go someplace that doesn't have an agenda and they know that they're brilliant and they've graduated from college or high school and they can't wait to get out there to, you know, hear themselves or hear um, the people they're going to organize. They're coming here because it's one of the few places in the country they can learn organizing in the framework of understanding how global imperialism operates. So we take these as very practical problems. I mean, yes, it's theoretical, but they're like, sort of like Steve was saying, um, you know, why is, why was my life like this in Korea? Oh yeah, it had something to do with the US occupation of Korea. Um, now I understand US imperialism a lot better because when I came from Korea, I didn't know anything about slavery in the United States, or I didn't know about the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo and the, the broken promises of indigenous peoples. Um, all these stories get woven together with, the, with an overarching framework of, yes, you know, we're a place that teaches, you know, imperialism, uh, 1001 maybe <laughs> and uh, don't come if you don't if you don't want to learn it but if you do this is what you can do here and I think um, there's no doubt that the students go through an, a major ideological transformation just by submerging themselves in the daily life of the working class spending you know four or five hours every day in the bus learning what life is really like regardless of what our campaign is and um, since one of our major objectives with the transformative organizing model 
is to develop a whole new generation of leadership that can change society. The school is really important for us. So I just wanted to note that and note that people who are interested in it can pursue learning about it from our website. And um, yeah, I mean, there's just so much more to say about it. But I, I think, what? OK. I think it's, it's an idea that we, we're playing with in the United States about different forms and ways to do this that aren't as concentrated as our program. And I certainly think, you know, it's something you could do here. Um, I had a couple of questions I wanted to ask um, to you, Cindy, I mean, um, uh, Christina, and whoever else might be able to answer, maybe Pascal. Um, when you talk about transforming and transformative organizing, why do you want to do that? Why do you want to have transformative organizing? I mean, what is it that you want to do? And also, um, three questions. Do you believe the people you're asking to join you are equal to you? Do you, do you see them as equal? Or are they, you know, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> people that you just want to help, <laughs> in other words. Uh, thirdly, do you understand that your vision may be inappropriate to those people or maybe even insulting to the people you want to, want to organize? Because to me, those are the kinds of questions you have to answer before you get ready to go into this process. Um, because other than that, it can be very disappointing for you and for the people you try to get, get, get engaged. As I spoke earlier about tiptoeing around the issue of color and leadership, that's something that you really have to face head on because if you don't, everybody will be whispering about it when you're not around, right? They talk about it when you're not around. So I would be very progressive about my policy, putting my policy in practice. I will be honest about it, you know, the history of the country, what has been, you know, the, the, the silence around the issues that have challenged many of the other people in, the, in Germany that have not necessarily challenged you. I will be honest about that. It's not your fault. You know, you're not, you're not, uh, you're not responsible for everything that's happened, but you do have some responsibility. But you're not the only one that has responsibility. Everybody has responsibility because we all play a part in it. Um, so, number one, I would take time, take the time to learn, not teach. When I go in among the people that I want to try to get to join me and, and get involved with this work, I would take the time to learn. And that means sitting down, letting other people tell you what the truth is to them. And not saying, oh no, you didn't read the history books. The history book says, this is what happened, don't do that. Just let them tell you what their lived experiences are and let those things be true. Because to them it's true. Um, you know, have dinner with them at their house. Have them to your house for dinner. Get common with them because in, when, you, when you go to war, you need people who are by your side. You need to know who they are and they need to know who you are because you're going to war if you're talking about transforming society. It's not going to just happen because you all got together one day and sang a song, you know, and then thought, oh, well, the government's going to change. We all sing the same song. So what? <laughs> nobody, nobody cares. Um, always protect, always provide a safe space and protect the people that are in the room and, and tell them you expect them to protect you too. Because sometimes you get in a room and people just want to jump on you. You're the one, you're the one. You expect the people that are in that room that you brought together to protect you as well as you're going to protect them. Um, number three, uh, that we all, not only you, but the ones you're organizing should all understand their role in creating and maintaining the societal chaos that we live in every day. Nobody is exempt. We all have a role in what has happened to this country and to our country in America too. Fourthly, one of the things we do in, in Chicago is we talk about p aligning our public and private transcript. Because a lot of times what people are saying public is something different from what they're saying private. So whatever you say privately should be, be said publicly about other races and other ethnicities and other religions. If you, if you can't get there, then you, you're just fooling yourself because you're living a lie. You're hypocritical. You get out and say, we're all equal, and then you say, oh, those dumb Muslims, they never do anything right. You know, privately, you never say that out public. It will come out in public. So even though you might not be, be successful in, in the first year, the second year, the third year, 
We are working continuously to make sure our public and private transcripts align so that we are saying the same thing all the time. And lastly, always be ready to move to action. One of the things we found out with our organizing, uh, United Congress and building these relationships and understanding each other, when something happened to one, of the, one race or the other, we were waiting for them to call us. You know, why didn't you call us until we saw it in the news, but we thought you would call us. That's not going to work. They're not going to call you. You have to just be there. You have to see it and then get involved in it. So always be ready to move and to act. Um, and this may seem hard, and it is hard, but it's a lot harder to just sit there and die. It's a lot harder to just sit there and die. So if we, we're going to transform our society because we want to make life better for us and for our children and for the future of this country or our country, then we got to be willing to fight for it. And if we don't, we know if we can watch the trajectory of our, our countries now and where they're going, if we don't like where it's going, we have, to, we have to do the hard work of bringing ourselves together to address these issues. But going back to those three questions, uh, why do you want to transform? Do you believe the people you're asking to join you are equal? And do you understand that your vision may be very inappropriate? And if so, is that okay? Das erste Problem meiner Antwort ist, dass ich das, was ich tue, in der, in, was ich vorher beschrieben habe in der politischen Arbeit, nicht als Organizing im engeren Sinne bezeichnen würde. Was, glaube ich, eines der Probleme ist der, Arbeit, die wir, der politischen Arbeit, die wir machen. Die politische Arbeit in diesem Organisieren von Demonstrationen und ähm, Veröffentlichen von Aufrufen, Plattformen, funktioniert nicht so, dass man sozusagen dieses Aufbauen von Basis, also dem Prozess, den ihr jetzt mehrfach beschrieben habt, sagen, ist man, man ähm, lädt Leute ein oder sucht sie auf, man spricht miteinander, man hört ihnen zu und dann fängt sozusagen langsam ein Prozess an, in dem man sich auf Forderungen einigt, sondern die, der, der normale Prozess der Linken bei uns ähm, ist das, ein bisschen was ich beschrieben habe, man lädt zu einem Bündnistreffen ein, dann kommen verschiedene Vertreter von Organisationen und Gruppen. Dann geht es grob darum, sozusagen, wollen wir was machen, wenn ja, was, wie viel, also was, welches Thema wollen wir nach vorne stellen, welcher Slogan, äh, was kommt in den Aufruf, wer formuliert den, wer überarbeitet ihn und hinterher kommt ein meistens relativ unleserlicher Text bei raus. Dieser Text wird zwischen 5 und 55.000 Mal vervielfältigt und in die Welt hinaus gepostet und ähm, je nachdem, also die, je nachdem, ob die Situation richtig eingeschätzt worden ist, ob der Text verständlich ist, ob das Bündnis sozusagen in den jeweiligen Zusammenhängen mobilisieren kann, wird es kommen zwischen 500 und 25.000 Leute normalerweise, in der, aber 25 ist schon selten, also da waren wir ja schon recht zufrieden eigentlich. <lacht> Das heißt, ich glaube, dass diese Arbeit ganz grundsätzlich diesen, diesen Mangel hat, dass es kein Prozess der Dauerhaftigkeit ist, die, ähm, die, auf der man aufbauen kann und in der es tatsächlich zu einer, ähm, zu einer Verbindung von persönlichen Interessen, persönlicher Transformation, wenn man so will, und gesellschaftlichen Veränderungen kommt. Das heißt, auf der anderen Seite, es ist gar nicht mein Problem oder bei den wenigsten Menschen, die da sitzen, dann glaube ich, ist das Problem, dass sie nicht öffentlich sagen, was sie wollen. Es ist eher das Problem, dass sie überhaupt nicht aus ihrer persönlichen Sprache rauskommen, in der sie ihre Vorstellungen von der Welt und ihre Forderungen formulieren, die weitestgehend von, nur von einigen Leuten verstanden und geteilt wird. Ähm, aber das, insofern ist es kein Problem des Lügens, weil, sie, weil man sich gar nicht die Mühe macht, sozusagen auf andere Sprachen zu kommen. Ähm, ich glaube, dass das ein bisschen, mein Pascal kann da ja auch noch, was zu sagen. Ich glaube, das ist in gewisser Weise auch ein Problem der linken Partei, die natürlich einerseits eine Struktur hat, die auch Basisorganisationen beinhaltet, die Leute sind da aktiv, diskutieren miteinander, also machen, ähm, produzieren Texte und äh, einigen sich über politische Aktionen und haben dann, also schicken dann Leute in Gremien und so weiter. Aber ich glaube, dass dieser Prozess der aktiven Einbindung von Leuten und des aktiven Ausgehen von deren Interessen und gemeinsames besprechen und in dieser, dem Verhandeln über welche Form von gesellschaftlicher Transformation will man eigentlich auch die Menschen mit zu verändern, dass das ein Prozess ist, der eher zurückgegangen ist 
oder zumindest auch diese Kontinuität vermissen lässt. Ich mache noch ein letztes Beispiel, weil ich vorher kurz von dieser antifaschistischen äh, radikalen Linken erzählt habe in den 90er Jahren. Wir hatten, äh, in gewisser Weise ist es ein bisschen entgegen Erfahrung zu dem, was Steve erzählt hat, von der Frau, die so verändert worden ist, von der Erfahrung äh, von Seattle. Wir haben ganz viele junge Leute, Schüler, ähm, angesprochen auch und ähm, ein Modell, das sehr umstritten war in der Antifa, aber ein Grundgedanke war schon auch, wenn die Leute in diese Konfrontationen reingehen, die uns weitestgehend aufgezwungen werden von der Polizei, aber dennoch sind sie dann da, ähm, dann verändern die sich in dieser Auseinandersetzung mit der Polizei. Und die Erfahrung, glaube ich, ist schon, das passierte auch in gewisser Weise, das war natürlich cool für die jungen Leute oder sie fanden das, sozusagen, sie haben sich dann in diese durchaus dauerhafte Politik der Antifa reinbegeben und im Laufe der Zeit, sozusagen, wenn so die harten Entscheidungen des Lebens kommen, was für einen Beruf will man, ein, will man ausüben, wie priorisiert man zwischen politischer Arbeit, ich will gar nicht sagen Karriere, aber sozusagen Professionalisierung des eigenen Lebens, ähm, wurde zumindest deutlich, dass diese persönliche Transformation keine Garantie ist, sondern dass die eine Transformation ist im Rahmen von politischen Kontexten oder sozialen Kontexten, die aber nicht ähm, äh, gefeit sind dagegen oder, oder geimpft dagegen sozusagen in ähm, neoliberale Verwertungsformen, in andere Formen von, von Lebens Gestaltung sozusagen überzugehen und dann driftet die Politik so aus. Sozusagen. Und das ist schon auch eine Frage, die mich beschäftigt, zu sagen, wie verbindet man, wie findet man sozusagen Prozesse, in denen die Leute, die sich darin engagieren, gemeinsam kontinuierliche Prozesse führen können, ohne dass jetzt irgendwie man aufdrücken will. Das ist ja eine offene Einladung, wer nicht möchte, kommt nicht sozusagen. Ja, soweit erstmal. Okay, um, so you can like, because I have a problem with talking. Um, so there are five points that I guess I want to try to make in five minutes. Um, the first one, uh, my comrade was, was helping me correct some things from my conversation yesterday. Um, it was saying that in some ways I was minimizing uh, the work that we were doing. And that made me think about a point in particular about transformative organizing, um, <clears throat> which is the work of taking folks who have been uh, told that they are nothing and uh, help them see themselves as folks, help them experience themselves as folks who can be governing, like Steve was talking about. And that the level of work that it takes for that to happen is very different than folks who already feel like they should be running things, right? Um, so to be doing organizing with uh, low-income folks of color, black and Latino folks in the South um, in public housing, right? Uh, and to have two of those folks who are like totally excited about the work is very different than for us to go to like a parent-teacher association and have folks who feel like they should be running their schools be like, oh yeah, we're ready. We can get 30 of those people, you know, like that. So. Um, in terms of a direct experience around that, me and a comrade who's, who helped start People's Durham, I remember before we started it, we went to the beach and uh, he identifies as transgender and we were having this conversation. We were like, we don't think we can do mass organizing or door-to-door -door organizing because we're worried that like we're out, we're queer, or whatever, and people are gonna be like, fuck you, you know, like who are you? You're this weird person, talk to me about whatever. Um, and it was like a terrifying idea about going um, door to door to have these conversations, right? Um, and I think the process of, I remember we did our march, right? And at the end of the march, I was like wearing a cape and like uh, the, these really tight pants or whatever, and I'm like running around. I was looking at a video of myself. I was like, oh my God, he's so gay. But <laughs> um, we're standing in this circle and there's this student who is in the junior um, ROTC, which is prep for like um, the military, right? Um, and he, we're all summing up what the experience was and you know, he just gave me all of these uh, appreciations, right? 
Um, and it did a lot for me to say, actually, it's possible for me, even for uh, straight identified men who are like oriented towards the military, that there's something about how I've approached, how I've built this relationship that's been transformative for him. And when we talk about uh, oppressed people who are at the center of multiple forms of oppression, learning to speak um, and learning to lead, how that then opens up spaces for everybody, right? And that it actually takes a tremendous amount, in the same way that we think about, uh, if we were to think about what it would take to overthrow the US military or whatever, right? Like um, overthrowing those things that have been internalized within a person that have, that have held back their ability to lead, right? And because of that, withdrawn all of those energies from our movements, not just from those folks who, who are the focus of that oppression, but in everybody else as well, right? Um, so that's one point that took longer than one minute. Um, then I think, uh, there's the question of, of vision, strategy, theory, um, and I think one of the things I mean when I talk about transformative organizing, um, which I don't think everybody means, but that I intend when I say it, um, is that we're transforming uh, not just the individual, not just organizations, not just society, um, but in order to do all of those things, transforming the left, right? Um, and that I actually don't believe that pragmatism exists. It's not real, right? That every practice has a theory. The question is, what kind of theory are we developing and what is the method through which we develop that theory, right? How does our practice inform our theory? If our practice contradicts it, do we ignore the practice, right? Or if it's more convenient for us to disguise our theory, do we call it just the practice, right? Um, and I think one of the things that we are trying to do um, with our work is to say Marxism does bring things to the table in terms of a scientific analysis of society, right? But our conception of how science develops doesn't mean that it's done over here by a bunch of people who have it figured out and who know the laws of societal development, right? That actually the process of arriving at an analysis of a society requires the listening, right? And that that listening isn't just, well, what do people say? Okay, well, that's it, and then we're gonna, um, then we're gonna go with that, right? Um, that the fusion between um, the scientific theory, right, the ideas in people's heads, and then the practice of struggle, right, is actually the way that we produce knowledge, right, all of those things interacting together. And that what we're actually trying to do is figure out ways of collectively learning and collectively acting, right, and that's what we mean by theory. That's what we mean by praxis, right, um, and I think that there's, always, it's always the case that when we come and speak to another person, they have some other way of thinking, right? Um, I don't think that uh, having an anti-capitalist vision uh, is contrary to um, the interests of the people who I work with. Um, I also don't think that I'm coming into the room with the truth and they're coming in with a bunch of brainwashed lies, right? Um, I think in the process of our interaction, we both discover the way that uh, to uh, again bring back more Marxist terms, bourgeois ideology is informing both of us, right? The way that capitalist ways of thinking are informing both how I'm talking about theory, how I'm talking about organizing, right? And how they're talking about their situation. That both of us are in this situation where our ideas are influenced by the society that we're coming from. So our interaction actually allows us to see that in each other, call that out, and say, okay, we, but we wanna collectively transform that. And I think that's how um, we begin to get deeper uh, into what's going on and getting a better understanding of what's happening. And to me, that's the essence of when we talk about radicalization, right? Going to the roots of these things. And I think that if we're actually getting at objective truth, we are going to hit upon the things that people experience in their everyday lives. And they, they will be able to, along with us, say, yes, that theory matches my experience, um, or nope, it doesn't match. And that means we got something wrong, right? And that in the uh, tradition I come from, um, or one of the traditions I come from and I'm influenced by uh, Mao, 
people talk explicitly about the mass line. You have to go out and listen to what people are experiencing. You have to take that back and systematize that, put that into practice, see what happens, right? Um, so I think that's the last thing I'm going to say because I took up a lot of time. I'm sorry. Your experience with that person can only happen on that level when you believe you and him or you and her are equal. If you, know, if you don't have this whole understanding of being the same, on the same level, you would never be able to experience that experience. That's right. And that's the question I asked that I haven't heard the answer yet to, you know, about as far as organizing among people who are, are they equal or not? Are they equal? They are? I mean, is, is there actually a left person in the room who would say no? There's one. <laughs> I think... Um, coming back to your question, I think people are profoundly unequal, 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 unequal. Um, however, we in this country, we live in a country where <sighs> colorblindness is a bliss. We live in a country where uh, people believe if you don't talk about racism, racism doesn't exist. Um, in some kind uh, in some sense, maybe. Um, that is a very perverted situation that goes back to the Shoah where systematically this country killed um, Jewish people, Roma people, uh, and others. Um, and because of that, it was very difficult for decades to speak about racism, because if you spoke about racism, that meant you approved the existence of races, which led to very bad things in, the, in this country's past. So until the 80s, maybe until today for the mainstream, we don't like uh, speaking about racism, we don't like speaking about color, uh, we don't like speaking about inequality, because we're good people. We're unionists, we're leftists, we're communists, we're whatever, that distinguishes us from the bad, evil mainstream of the society um, that is racist that is capitalist, that is sexist, that is homophobic, that is whatever. Everything bad is them. We, because we're leftists, because we're unionists, because we're in a social movement, are good people. It doesn't happen here in our part of society. Um, I think that's part of the problem. And that's, uh, that's why I uh, very much liked what especially um, the, the two speakers in the panel before from the United States said. Um, you need to reflect on differences. You need to reflect on inequalities. You need to reflect on power relations. Because being a majority doesn't mean a thing. It depends on who, has, like, who, ha who makes the decisions, who defines the problems, um, who asks whom to speak about what. Um, and we don't do that in this country. At least a lot of people don't do it, and in that sense, as a member of the left party and as someone who works with, um, with the foundation, I have to say that is true for the left as well. The le social left, the party, um, the social movements. Um, and I think we have a long way to go um, until we reach the point that you are at. Not because it's paradise in the United States, but um, speaking about race as a social construction that leads to uh, manifestations of inequality is practically impossible in this country, I think. At least in the mainstream and probably in large parts of like left-wingish scenes also. Um, I don't know how to overcome that, but I, I, th I think uh, what you said the three questions that you posed need to be underlined, like, boldly. Um, and we have to really uh, do some work in that field before we can seriously and honestly go out and say, I like to work with you, do you like to work with me? Um, because that would include a reflection on uh, one's privileges and deep, whatever, the other. <laughs> um, um, because we're all part of a racist society. Some benefit from it, some don't, because they're discriminated against. But understanding racism, um, like uh, sexism, like homophobia, like uh, other phobias, um, would be, I think, a milestone um, and the overlaps. 
I have to add, because nobody's just whatever people, a person of color or woman or uh, gay or lesbian or trans person, um, these things overlap. And we have to understand the uh, the phenomena per se and the overlaps maybe in order to, in five million years, be able to fight together and stand together, trust each other, uh, respect respectfully speak to each other and about others. I think we're far away in this country. Um, we are interesting that we're all using the word transformative organizing, which is good, which means in some way we think we are all transformative organizers trying to do work, but then we have differences, you know, differences. So I want to focus to say that I think the essence of transformative organizing in the West is challenging the empire in which we live and having an international strategy that goes beyond trying to make things better inside the so-called home country when all the Western countries benefit from colonialism and our government, the United States, is the leading imperialist power in the world. So it doesn't make sense to talk about the economic crisis at home or health care at home when the United States is invading Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia. Um, there's a strange distinction between I'm working in communities of color, I'm working in low-income communities, but the question is what are you working for and against? And I think one of the things we should be working against is the role of our own governments in the world. So uh, one example of that is I was at the United Nations and we were trying to get a world summit on sustainable development which was going to involve corporations not polluting. And the United States, it's in my book that the United States, they call it just cans, Japan, US, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia always say no to whatever the UN is trying to do progressive. This is a, a negative block. So by accident, some guy from the United Nations, thinking his microphone was off, says, what are we going to do about the United States with a sense of total frustration? And we picked that up in, in Bali and made t-shirts. What are we going to do about the United States? Because that really is the challenge. All over the world is the point. That the United States is the world's bully, is the world's policeman, is the largest um, emitter of greenhouse gases, is the largest user of energy, is the largest um, squandering of money inside the world. But as an organizer, I don't mainly focus on critique. I focus on what we're trying to fight for that embodies that critique and tries to provide its opposite. So that's why I want to focus on demand development, because I think demand development gets to the one question right away. What is it that you people are fighting for? And if you make it clear enough, they become very ideological and very counter-hegemonic. So I'm going to give an example. At the General Motors plant in Van Nuys, California, we tried to keep a plant open. And we said that General Motors had no right to close the plant. That in itself was counteracting the whole theory of management rights, which is that it's GM's plant, and they have every right to do whatever they want with it. So in my book, <clears throat> I just want to say, the organizer is the smallest human unit around whom you can build a project, a campaign, an organization. An organizer does not operate as a loner. By her nature, she belongs to and is loyal to an organization. The organizer represents the views of the organization with the goals of recruiting new members. Once the members join, the organizer's job is to mentor, sustain, support, and learn from the membership. The transformative organizer brings new people into a movement to challenge the ideology, institutions, and policies of the system and is fighting for the most radical and revolutionary changes. So the way that that is reflected again is we then went into a community 
in Wilmington, California, where the biggest issue was the emissions coming from the oil refineries. And we were demanding dramatic reductions in the emissions, a community health clinic, but then we found out that Texaco had also been polluting in Ecuador and had done what's called a drill and run, where they drill and then they just left a massive uh, oil spill all over Ecuador. And Ecuador was suing Texaco. So we decided to unite with Ecuador against Texaco, which changed the nature of the campaign into an international campaign. At the, uh, also at GM Van Nuys, we racialized and gendered the issue. You have to understand how little the labor movement ever wants to talk about race and gender. So when we say keep Van Nuys open because it's the last black plant in Los Angeles, it's the last Chicano plant in Los Angeles, it's the last women's plant in Los Angeles, we got feedback from a lot of white men saying, but why don't you say it's the last white guy's plant in, America, in, in Los Angeles? And we said, well, that's not the point. There's a specific, anyway, we had to go into a whole debate about why it was a civil rights issue. In the Bus Riders Union, we have a slogan called Fight Transit Racism, which is very controversial again. A lot of people say, why do you have to say Fight Transit Racism? Why don't you just say a better bus system for everybody? But again, it's counter-hegemonic demand development because the buses reflect racial discrimination inside society. In our community rights campaign, I told you about it, that we're trying to stop the pre-prisoning of students, but we also have a slogan called no gang databases. That is to say we want to dismantle the California gang database, which is an alleged list of people who are in gangs. In fact, you can be placed on that gang database by either having gang colors, being known to hang around with a person in a gang, Really, and there's 10 criteria, and a cop can come up to you and simply say, young woman, young man, um, do you have any pot on you? And they say, no, well, let me just see your ID. They take your ID, they put you in the gang database, you don't know it, and then five years later, you shoplifted a 7-Eleven, and the judge is about to give you a suspended sentence when he says, aha, you're a member of a gang. Based on this, I have to give you four years, really. So that obviously challenges the community because the community is afraid of gangs. So when we say no gang database, it's transformative organizing because we have to have a struggle with the community that we do not think gangs are the main problem. We have another slogan, a thousand more buses, a thousand less police. It's very clear. I have had nobody say to me, I don't get it. I've had lots of people say to me, I don't agree with it. But the demand itself, which is real, is something that forces a choice on people about the social welfare state, not the police state, going back to transformative organizing. In our immigrant rights work, we support open borders and amnesty for immigrants. I think you know in the United States there's this thing called immigration reform. Well, anything called reform in the United States, you should be very worried about. It has three components. One is militarizing the border. The second is registering the hell out of immigrants and making them pay all kinds of fines and be in another database. And third is the so-called path to citizenship. All they've done so far is build the wall. That's all they've done is keep building the wall and militarizing. So the open borders demand is gonna raise what? How can we let these people into the United States? which is going to raise questions about what role is the United States playing all over the world. How dare the United States worry about who's coming in since the United States is the greatest invader of everybody else's territory, now throwing um, drones into Pakistan. Um, I think if we work for better transportation, I mean, Power is a, is a sister organization. We're both working for better transportation inside the inner city, but the value of GGJ is we're going to relate it to get rid of the 800 bases that the United States has all over the world. We want to control U.S. emissions. We want to end U.S. wars. We want reparations for black people in America because of the transatlantic slave trade. 
which addresses again the German problem that a lot of white Americans say, transatlantic slave trade, I wasn't even born when that happened. And we say yes, but the United States is still formed by that and its reflections are today. And I would be able to point out, I believe, that the reflections of Hitler are in Germany today. It is not a closed question. And neither is the genocide against the indigenous people. So my point is, is if we raise demands in a way that raise profound questions about the society, that's the essence of transformative organizing. And if, no matter how radical our demands are, if they stay within the territorial borders of the United States, I would argue they're not fundamentally revolutionary and they could possibly be its opposite. Ich muss sagen, ich bin etwas verwirrt, war ich auch die letzten Tage schon, weil ich manchmal nicht weiß, worüber wir eigentlich sprechen. Meine Erwartung, als ich hierher gekommen bin, war, wir sprechen über Erfahrung, über verschiedene Konzepte von Organizing und wir haben uns viele Gäste aus den USA eingeladen und diejenigen, die hier hinkommen aus Berlin oder aus anderen Ländern, dachte ich, haben ein Interesse, wir wollen neue Formen von linken Organisationen, Bündnissen gründen. Und wir haben wenig bisher gehört aus dem Publikum, was das Interesse ist. Mein Interesse ist nicht, und das ist es schon länger nicht mehr, mich zu streiten, was wirklich revolutionär ist und was reformistisch ist. Ich finde diesen Antagonismus auch für die deutsche Situation mit den unterschiedlichsten Erfahrungen nicht hilfreich. Ich hätte den Vorschlag und den Wunsch, auch nach dieser Konferenz eine Konversation darüber zu beginnen, was wir an unseren Formen von Organisationen, sozialen Bewegungen, Koalitionen in Berlin und darüber hinaus, was nicht funktioniert und warum wir denken, dass wir neue Formen brauchen, warum wir neue Menschen hinzugewinnen können und wie wir das tun. Und ich glaube, da haben wir ganz, ganz viel zu lernen von euch, von Cindy, von Sendolo, von Steven. Wir haben vielleicht auch Differenzen. Und eine, die ganz stark ist, glaube ich, auch auf Seiten der Linken, oder wo ich denke, dass man sie hier auch noch mal formulieren sollte. Steven, I agree with all your points. I don't agree with the third point, CADA development. And I think this has much to do with our, the issues that were raised, our relationship to the people. I mean, do you, um, do you um, talk with the people you work with you know, and, and you say, I'm your CADA, you know, I tell you what to do. I think this is a very Leninist kind of approach. And um, yesterday, Alex, I think, um, raised the point that in the German context, CADA is a very problematic concept, and I think also leadership. And I think this is the most puzzling aspect of, for me, um, I have been to the United States and now for your organization, your understanding, and also Leanne and Eric, your understanding of I'm the, you know, the, the role of the individual organizer towards, you know, the, you know, I don't understand this concept. And I think this is for me very important to learn about because I think we do need education and training. I think we need, you know, to learn how to facilitate meetings, how to give, you know, discussions better direction and how to be more effective. I think the German left is really good in, you know, organizing mass um, demonstrations, like, you know, against G8 meetings. Then we come back to our cities and we find we don't have any base in our neighborhoods and cities. And we don't know how to reach, you know, new constituencies and new people. I think we have a really big deficit there. But I am have tr I have, I'm having trouble with this concept of leadership, you know, either, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's Zelensky start organizing or, you know, transformative. I think there is this very problematic aspect for me. And maybe you guys could answer or respond to that. And I think that would be also very helpful when we talk about it later, you know, once this conference is over, what kind of organizing we can think of for Berlin or Hamburg or other places. I think, Max, you mentioned that as well, that this is not the idea of, you know, our organizing You want to add something? Ja, ich denke, alle, wie wir hier sitzen, haben wir, glaube ich, ein verbindendes Interesse daran, nämlich Bewegung zu werden mit anderen Menschen. Also das, was äh, der, unser Freund aus Griechenland, der hier ist, uns erzählt hat, also dass tatsächlich sich Räume öffnen, dass äh, so ein 
die Terminkalender weggeschmissen werden, wie es so schön heißt und plötzlich so ein Ausblick auf eine ganz neue Gesellschaft möglich wird. Und das ist ja die Frage, wie kommen wir dahin? Meistens sind es irgendwelche Umbrüche, also dass tatsächlich irgendeine Quantität erreicht wird, irgendeine eine Mittelklasse zum Beispiel ins Rutschen kommt, die eine Dynamik auslöst, also etwas, was von außen kommt, was spontan kommt, wo die Linke sich drin bewegen kann, aber was sie nicht initiieren kann. Das ist bei uns hier nicht so. Bei uns gab es die Einführung der Hartz-IV-Gesetzgebung, es gab die Montagsdemonstrationen, aber in einem viel kleineren Rahmen als jetzt beispielsweise das, was in, in Griechenland oder Spanien passiert. Das liegt natürlich an der besonderen Stellung von Deutschland, um jetzt hier mal im deutschen Kontext zu bleiben. Das heißt, wir brauchen Strategien, die, die es ermöglichen, zu einer Bewegung zu kommen, aber trotzdem nicht... Ähm, und das zeichnet die Deutsche Linke ja aus, trotzdem kann uns nicht darauf reduzieren, dass wir einen identitären Standpunkt außerhalb einnehmen. Ich meine, die Deutsche Linke ist, glaube ich, international dafür berühmt, dass sie auf einem unglaublich hohen intellektuellen Niveau äh, debattiert, Analysen erstellt und so weiter und aber auch genauso berühmt dafür, keine Entsprechung zu haben auf der, auf der Ebene der Praxis, der Organisierung. So, also lassen wir uns darauf ein, wir sagen, es gibt keine andere Chance als diesen Weg der Organisierung zu probieren, ähm, auszuprobieren. In dem Moment lernen wir von den Freunden aus USA zum Beispiel, dass es dieses, Orga dass dieses Organizing gibt, dass es sogar noch etwas da gibt, was darüber hinaus weiß, Transformative Organizing. Ähm, wenn wir von Organizing sprechen, gibt es dann aber verschiedene Fallen, die auftreten können. Zum Beispiel, wenn wir sagen, wir wollen Bewegung werden. Ähm, der Freund aus Griechenland hat es gesagt, da kann man das Ziel nicht vorweggeben. Die können nicht dahin sagen, können sagen, wir wollen Sozialismus und jetzt schauen wir, wie wir da hinkommen. Organizing arbeitet aber mit dem Grundsatz, first we imagine victory, then we start to planning backwards. Also erstmal das Ziel, vor, das, den Sieg vorwegnehmen, dann zu überlegen, wie kommt man dahin. Jetzt hat Steve Williams, und das fand ich sehr erhellend gesagt, beim Transformative Organizing geht es eben nicht darum, ähm, äh, unbedingt zu siegen, deswegen bauen wir das auch nicht so auf. Das eröffnet natürlich viel mehr Möglichkeiten, dass sich eine Bewegung entfaltet, als wenn man wirklich sagt, äh, Eskalationsplan, Stufe 1, Stufe 2, Stufe 3 und dann Sieg. So, das ist, das ist, schon, mal, das ist schon mal wirklich ein Fortschritt auch da drin. Aber auf der anderen Seite war nicht davor, die Illusion zu haben, dass es wirklich, wenn man mit solchen Elementen wie Organizing arbeitet, dass es tatsächlich eine Begegnung auf Augenhöhe geben kann. Also der Freund aus Willensburg ist heute nicht mehr da, der hätte das sonst erzählt, ihre äh, Organisation der Mieterinnen da, wie sie da hingekommen sind. Er sagt, die wussten ganz genau, was sie von ihnen, also den besser Ausgebildeten, wollten. Die, äh, die wussten, die haben Kontakte zur Presse, die wussten, sie können äh, Druck machen, indem sie formulieren können und so weiter. Dafür haben sie sie sozusagen benutzt. Die Leute von der Organisierung, von Arbeitskreisumstrukturierung, wussten genau, dort können wir einen Konflikt anzetteln, der ausstrahlt in die Stadt hinein, nach Willensburg, der Beispiel gibt für andere Mieter. Sie haben sich also gegenseitig benutzt in dem Wissen, dass sie nicht auf derselben Augenhöhe sind. Das ist die Frage. Was will man? Ich, ich denke, man muss es reflektieren, dass man aufgrund unterschiedlicher Herkunft, Bildungsstand und so weiter nicht auf selber Augenhöhe ist. Das muss man unbedingt tun, aber man kann nicht die Augen davor verschließen zu sagen, das, das wäre nicht so. Ach so. Well, but I wanted to ask you, sort of, what's the concern about uh, cadre or leadership? Maybe somebody else wants to ask. We both want to speak to what's the question? question? What's the concern about cadre or leadership? You mean what the problem is? Why we have a problem with building cadres? Mm -hmm. Because it's an authoritarian concept. You know, from our experience, and we, I don't want to be told by somebody who knows exactly how the world functions, you know, what to do, and um, it's a, either a paternalistic relationship to you know, the people you work together with. I think educating people, or you know, to, to have an idea how we can learn together is something else than having a you know institution. Or you know, we have we have this tradition of left parties with cadres, and we have bad experiences with that. Ich wollte noch mal sagen, ich finde das Beispiel, was du gesagt hast, eigentlich ganz gut. 
Weil ich finde eben nicht, dass es nicht auf derselben Augenhöhe ist. Ich finde, man hat einfach nur andere Ressourcen und man hat andere Zugänge und natürlich sozusagen ist es, dann hat man sozusagen nicht den gleichen Zugang vielleicht äh, zu Medien oder gehört zu werden oder sowas. Ne? Aber es das heißt auch noch lange nicht, dass ich nicht mit dem mit der Person quasi in, diesem, in dieser täglichen Arbeit auf gleicher Augenhöhe bin. Weißt du, was ich meine? Also vielleicht, ich finde es dann auch schwierig, das so, so zu denken. Also wenn ich jetzt zum Beispiel mit einer Erzieherin ab, äh, arbeite und ich sehe, die hat, ähm, die hat Fähigkeiten, sozusagen Leute zu bewegen um sie rum. Ja? Die kann ähm, die hat eine gute Sprache, dann ist, also dann würde ich sagen, sozusagen fördere ich sie in, also in, ihre, in, in der Qualifikation, weil ich finde, dass, ähm, dass sie sozusagen wichtige Punkte, die andere vielleicht nicht sagen können gerade, was überhaupt nicht heißt, dass sie das nie sagen können, aber weil sie das genau machen kann. Ne? Das, da empfinde ich meine Rolle irgendwie als Gewerkschaftsorganiserin. So, mag sein, dass das andere problematisch finden, aber... Für mich ist das, äh, genau, das würde für mich zum Beispiel Cultural Development sein. Um, so, I think this is a fun conversation. Um, and I think it underscores a little bit the difference of context. Um, so, in some respects, I think, uh, what this point is really trying to draw out is some of the conversation about leadership and democracy. And I think oftentimes those are posed as opposites and mutually exclusive. Um, what we have been really trying to innovate, and I think certainly is reflective of our practice within power, but I think is true with all of the organizations that are here from the United States, is that we're trying to figure out ways that we can both promote leadership, but do that in a way that's democratic. And in fact, by doing that, we encourage more participation. So there is a current of politics in the United States, and I don't think it's just in the United States, but I think it responds to the authoritarianism of the socialist experiments in the 20th century. And there is this push towards in the United States often talked about as horizontalism or sort of flat decision-making structures where nobody is identified as a leader. There may be some instances where that works. In my experience, what that often does is masks who's actually in leadership. So that by saying nobody's in leadership, it means that the person who is in leadership doesn't have to be held accountable by the rest of the group because we're all in leadership. In my experience, having leadership does not necessarily guarantee that you're going to have democratic participation. And I've seen in organizations that I've participated in abuses. But at least in those instances, I know where, how the abuses are, are taking place and what mechanisms of accountability we might be able to, to put in place. I think that our generation of leftists has to grapple with this question of how is it that we're promoting democratic participation. In my experience, we are not all equal. But that doesn't mean that we can't have mutually even participation. I have particular experiences, privileges of having gone to university that puts me in a different position than many of the people in my organization. Now that does not mean that I'm any smarter than them. For example, I told the story yesterday about the labor leaders calling and sort of threatening us. My practice was, well, I'm going to refer back to the organization because we're going to make that decision together. If I had been left to make that decision alone, I might have made a different decision. But it's the wisdom of the group. We have to be able to figure out a way of developing new forms of leadership that one, acknowledges the roles that particular uh, people play in different positions within organizations, but also acknowledges the leadership that people at lower levels of the organization play. So for example, people who come to meetings and are constructive in meetings like they actually follow the agenda, 
or follow the time limit, I would say is exerting a particular brand of leadership. When African American members who don't speak any Spanish come in and they greet Spanish speaking members, they're exerting leadership. They're creating a cultural dynamic where folks are engaging with one another even though it's difficult for them to do that. Now they may be getting paid by the organization, they may be in an official title within the organization, but even if they're not, I would say that they're exerting leadership in the organization. People may come in and they're pissed off about what happened to them on the bus, but they take responsibility to talk to somebody about it and then leave that outside so that they can productively participate in the meeting, that's exerting leadership. So one, I think we have to more broadly define what leadership is, but we also have to figure out a way of being able to hold that collectively. My push would be that we can't step away from that responsibility. Now, the reason why I use the term cadre as opposed to leadership is because leadership in the United States, I think, is particularly charged. Um, and, and because of the sort of uh, historical break of left traditions in the United States, cadre is sort of this open word that nobody really understands. So we get to define it however we define it. Now, the German context may be very different, but the task, I think, is very much the same. Thank you very much. Eric. Um, do you want to go next? Okay. Well, first of all, I want to thank Steve because word for word, <clears throat> what, what he said is what I would have said. And so I'd like to just elaborate on it. Um, <clears throat> the, the first thing is, as you were saying, we all have to understand, and it takes sometimes a three-day or five-day meeting, or sometimes it takes a year of working together before we fully understand what the other person is trying to say. <laughs> but I also come from a movement, I've been in the movement you know, since 1964, and there have been all kinds of models of bad leadership. There's been the male heavy, we used to call it, in the 60s. You know, these guys who were just on speaking tour, it seemed to me. They had no relationship to the members. Now, I was lucky. My job was a field secretary and a traveling uh, organizer. So I would come into the chapters, and the chapters would have 30, 40, 50 people, and they would welcome me. And I'd spend three days with them talking about, so how's it going? What are some of the conflicts going on? Um, Oh, that's interesting. So you're having internal leadership conflicts or you're having conflicts with the administration. Let's work on it. Let's talk about it. Some of the women would come up to me even back then and say, there's so much male chauvinism in the, in the, in the uh, chapter that women f are quitting. They're, that's, they're voting with their feet. Not that I was not at 23 filled with male chauvinism and it's not like I don't have any today but I had a little bit more awareness that there was a women's movement and there were certain things being asked of behaviors that were different than the way SDS was being organized. So one of the things I like about my own history is I've always been an organizer tied to a lot of people. And I have a thing there called an organizer um, has a base and never walks alone. So one of the ways you can judge a good organizer as one thing is when the person comes to a meeting, does she or he come with 10 people, three people, or nobody? And I think somebody else said, if you come with nobody, I don't know, did you say that? No, somebody else says taking a walk. Yes, yeah, taking a walk. Um, now, at the Strategy Center, we have people, the average person at the Strategy Center has been there for five years, member and staff. We have members who have been there for 18 years. We have very low turnover. We have three languages that we speak in, Korean, Spanish, and English. And just like Steve was saying, that in itself is a form of leadership because Barbara Lott Holland, who's black, sees especially some black people who don't want to put on their headsets when Latinos are speaking. And what in essence they're saying is speak English. So Barbara says, put your headset on in a very firm way, goes up to them quietly sometimes and says, 
put your head up. And if the person says no, she says, I think you should leave the meeting because you don't have the right to speak if you don't have the willingness to listen. So we, we have a tough love, but that's otherwise, what would that Latina think? Is she speaking and another person doesn't even want to put on the headphones to listen? So we have done, the other thing is training. It's very important in terms of racial oppression and national oppression and women's oppression that one of the forms of that is being taught that you can't lead, that it's the white man who can lead. You, you could be second in charge, you could be a lieutenant, you could be tanto, you know, all that kind of stuff. And we've been training women and people of color to say, no, you're being trained to lead. You're gonna be put in charge of a campaign very soon. So in the school for organizers, when they go on the bus, their first day, they go with a, a more skilled organizer and 80% of our organizers are women. The next day, they're told, you do the back of the bus, I'll do the front of the bus. And you can see that panic in the person's eyes. But what do you mean, do the back of the bus? Well, there's 50 people, in the, you want the front? You do the front of the bus, I'll do the back of the bus. But you're now in charge of talking to 25 people, some of whom are going to hate you, some of whom are going to throw their newspaper at you, some of whom are going to say, don't you see I have two kids and five bags? And then you go up to another woman with two kids and five bags and she wants to talk to you. And she says, how come you didn't talk to me? Well, you looked busy. Well, did you not give me a chance? Mm -hmm. So when you go out with the people, the people talk back. It's wrong to assume that oppressed nationality people have no participatory interests and that you can just ride roughshod over the masses and think you're gonna come back with a base. <clears throat> it's that empathetic side that I talk about. Generosity of spirit is one of the qualities of a good organizer. A good listener is a quality of a good organizer. Your point is, are you equal? At the most fundamental sense, yes. It otherwise will not work. Barbara Lott Holland says that organizing is fundamentally a relationship between peers. I have something I want to say. I have an agenda. Can I talk to you? We think the MTA buses are very overcrowded. We think it's a form of racism. We think the MTA is putting a lot of money into the rail projects. How do you feel about it? And also tell me a little bit about your history. So the first thing is it's not very dogmatic in a bus with 60 people that everybody would vote 60 to nothing that the, boat, the, vote is, the bus is overcrowded. That's not being a bad leader. That's just getting right to the point. But then you talk to the woman and she says, and I, this is a question I've been asking our organizers to ask more. Early in the game, ask them, have you ever been involved in the movement before? Because there's been an assumption that the person you're talking to is just a poor person or a working class person. And what you'll get is, well actually in El Salvador I led a struggle. Actually, I just was fired in the United States from leading a sweatshop struggle. There's leadership on the bus. And if you find that leadership, those are people who are already leaders, who want to be brought in as leaders. So just building on Steve's you know, theoretical, not, no, not his overview, is we believe in democracy, we believe in leadership. The people want leadership. The people do not want anarchy. They want to know who the hell is going to take on, you know, who's running the meeting, who's in charge of what. And the last thing also, like Steve, is I was meeting with the CEO of the MTA. And we were having a nego negotiation. He put a deal on the table that was unbelievable, a million dollar deal for new buses. And I said, that's really very interesting. I'll, I'll take it back to the group and we'll get back to you. He looked at me like I was fuck. What, what do you mean you're gonna take it back to the group? I'm offering you a million dollars. I said, yeah, with certain conditions, like don't say racism, like stop your sit-ins, um, like other things you're saying. Um, it's an, an interesting offer. I'm gonna take it back. I'll get two days. I'll get back to you in two days. Now I called the group. We met. Everybody showed up. They didn't say, well, we only meet on Wednesdays. I mean, something happened in history. 
Everybody got there within two hours. We had a long discussion of the offer. We brought back some counter offers, but we basically thought it was a great offer. It was a victory. But even if it was a victory, we spent four hours because we don't trust these people checking under the hood, you know, I mean, just what are they up to? And then we went back, and I was allowed to be the representative to go back to Julian Burke and said, we accept your deal, and we have a few conditions of our own. And it was a major breakthrough in the buying of buses. So I think maybe what, because we've been all, you know, mainly talking in 10-minute bites, that we didn't convey enough of the texture of our work. And by not conveying enough of the texture of our work, um, certain stereotypes could have been made because we were focusing a lot, at least, you know, on some of the strategic questions facing the movement. But I think you were asking from the early gate, I have other questions, which is, how do you even treat your people? How do you build an organization? And I want you to know that we have tons of conversations about that at the Strategy Center. Tons of it. We're talking about it all the time, and we now have membership development organizers whose main job is to make sure the membership is doing well, that the membership is participating, to go and ask them how they really feel about being in the organization, what criticisms do they have of how it operates, what suggestions do they have of how it could be better, and people stick around when they do think they're being consulted and their voice is heard. Thank you very much. And thank you both for letting us have the time to respond to that. That was a really good challenge. Ja, immer noch Pascal, aber trotzdem. Ähm, äh, auch danke von mir an Steve und Eric. Also die Zeit habe ich Ihnen gerne gelassen, weil das, was Sie gesagt haben, wie schon vermutet, würde ich auch unterstreichen. Es geht natürlich vielfach in der deutschen Debatte um Begriffe. Natürlich ist der Begriff übersetzt Leader, Führer äh, in Deutschland nicht verwendbar. Aus gutem Grund, weil es ein autoritäres Konzept ist. Das heißt nämlich, dass Leitungsfunktionen von oben nach unten eingesetzt werden. Das ist der Kern des Führerprinzips. So, das ist natürlich was, was für jede linke demokratische Organisation undenkbar ist, was wir aber auch in der Geschichte äh, der sozialistischen, äh, der linken Parteien auch hatten. Ja? Das muss man auch dazu sagen. Äh, von daher ist entscheidend, dass man ein demokratisches Organisationsprinzip haben, aber die, umso größer die Organisationen werden, umso mehr müssen natürlich auch Verantwortliche erkennbar sein, die müssen demokratisch legitimiert gewählt sein, kontrollierbar sein und abberufbar sein. Das ist das zentrale Kennzeichen und Organisationen, die das nicht haben, haben ein Problem, äh, sind auch keine äh, fortschrittlichen Organisationen. Ähm, äh, aber ansonsten brauchen wir das und wir müssen natürlich auch bei der, äh, egal in welcher Organisation, müssen wir meines Erachtens natürlich äh, schauen, wer ist bereit, wie weit zu gehen. Wir werden immer unterschiedliche Charaktere, Menschen haben, die unterschiedlich bereit sind, weit zu gehen, auch unterschiedliche äh, Bedürfnisse an Qualifizierung äh, beispielsweise entwickeln. Äh, da ist der Begriff auch Kader im, im Deutschen vielleicht äh, falsch äh, irgendwie und nicht zu verwenden, aber natürlich geht es darum äh, zu identifizieren, wer will Verantwortung übernehmen, braucht und möchte gerne gewisse Qualifikationen erwerben und wer möchte einen Schritt weiter gehen. Und ich finde, das ist auch überhaupt nicht äh, falsch, wenn man, wenn man das äh, entsprechend äh, vorantreibt und äh, es darf nicht elitär werden. Werden. Das ist die Gefahr, wenn man sagt, es ist exklusiv, es gab nur ein kleiner, äh, bescheidener Teil von Leuten, die diese Qualifikation erwerben, dann ist es ein Problem. Aber wenn wir sagen, wir möchten möglichst viele Leute befähigen, äh, auch solche Verantwortung zu übernehmen, ist es meines Erachtens Fortschritt. Da stehe ich ganz äh, auf der Seite von dem, was Steve und Eric da gesagt haben. Äh, vielleicht nochmal zu den Fragen, die vorhin äh, von äh, dir kamen. Ähm, also ich glaube, dass das Kernproblem bei dem äh, aus meiner Sicht, ich bin ja eher sozusagen auf der, auf der, auf der nationalen Ebene äh, tätig, aber auch zum Teil nochmal ehrenamtlich auch äh, vor Ort, ähm, ist natürlich die Frage, können wir eigentlich ähm, Kampagnen äh, mit einer hohen Beteiligung, mit einer hohen Aktivität nur an lokalen Themen schaffen oder schaffen wir es eigentlich äh, verallgemeinerbare Forderungen nach vorne zu stellen. Also das ist also die Erfahr alle Erfahrung, auch das, was äh, Christina vorhin gesagt hat, ist ja, es gibt eine Tendenz, auch in der radikalen Linken, äh, sagen wir gehen wieder zurück zur Scholle, also zurück zu dem hier vor Ort, äh, weil das ist das, wo die Leute am ehesten irgendwie sich mobilisieren lassen. Das 
widerspricht ein bisschen meinem, äh, sagen wir, meiner, meiner grundpolitischen Motivation, weil ich sage, der Kernkonflikt, dem wir heute gegenüberstehen, heute in Zeiten, wo der Kapitalismus äh, in eine, zumindest äh, eine gewisse Krisenphase durchläuft, um mal vorsichtig zu sagen, äh, ist, ja, aber die hat er schon viele gehabt, ist, also nicht, dass es das falsch verstanden wird, dass es jetzt vielleicht die letzte Krise sein könnte. Ähm, nein, also in der Situation, wo äh, wahnsinnige Verteilungsfragen anstehen, die Frage ansteht, ob Milliarden, äh, Billionen äh, an Geldern irgendwie äh, denen zugeschoben werden, die eh schon sozusagen von diesem System profitiert haben und wer dafür bezahlt, wie weit man diese Frage eigentlich mobilisierungsfähig machen kann, das ist eine Frage, die sich mir stellt. Da kann man, glaube ich, methodisch ganz viel von dem lernen, was die Kolleginnen und Kollegen aus den USA erzählen. Also ich finde, da sind wir in, den USA, in Deutschland Meilen, Jahre, Jahrzehnte hinter dem zurück, was in den USA diskutiert wird. Aber umgekehrt, sage ich mal, ist die Frage, gibt es ein erfolgreiches Beispiel aus den USA, wo es gelungen ist, die Fragmentierung auch der, der US-amerikanischen Linken insofern zu überwinden, dass man auch eine nationale Kampagne mal erfolgreich zu Ende gebracht hat? Das ist, finde ich, eine spannende Frage, weil ich sage mal, da würde ich noch einmal auf das zurückkommen, was Eric eingangs gesagt hat, was, welche Rolle spielt für uns eigentlich das Erbe, die geschichtliche Erfahrung des Nationalsozialismus? Also ich als Gewerkschafter, nicht als Mitglied der Linken, habe gelernt, sozusagen, dass eine der Lehren ist, man soll sich nicht spalten lassen und eine der, der katastrophalen Erfahrungen der Weimarer Republik und der Niedergang und der Niederlage gegenüber dem Faschismus ist, dass man die Arbeiterbewegung gespalten hat, dass die Gewerkschaftsbewegung zumindest nicht konsequent an einem Strang gezogen hat und dass das nie wieder passieren darf. Wir haben sozusagen eher dann nach 68 eine gegenteilige Bewegung der Zerfledderung der Linken. Jetzt sage ich mal ganz bescheiden, irgendwie die Linke hat jetzt nur als Partei hat nur einen ganz, ganz, ganz kleinen Ausschnitt auch der Linken in Deutschland versucht zusammenzuführen. Ich würde mich freuen, ob wir noch viel mehr damit machen, aber ich weiß auch, dass es viele aus unterschiedlichen Gründen nicht tun. Aber die Frage ist schon, ist diese Fragmentierung, die wir haben, nicht ein großes Problem? Also ich würde mir wünschen, wenn wir da weniger drüber uns, sagen wir mal, Probleme hätten damit, wenn mal schnell eine Organisation größer als 20 Leute wird ähm, und äh, dann äh, man sich morgen wieder am liebsten spaltet, äh, sondern überlegt, wie man das mehr zusammenführen kann und das eben nicht nur auf, dem, auf der Ebene eben der äh, punktuell an einem Thema, weil es ist natürlich auch für uns, letzter Satz, dann ist es für uns auch als Partei eine Frage, wo setzen wir denn eigentlich dann Ressourcen ein, wo sind Schwerpunkte zu setzen, welche großen Probleme haben wir denn? Wir haben die Finanzmarktkrise, wir haben den Krieg in Afghanistan als Vorteil, wir haben auf lokaler Ebene in Hamburg wie in Berlin die Situation, dass äh, die, die Mieten explodieren, also was, was sind, wo setzen wir da, kriegen wir das hin, da gemeinsam eigentlich Positions oder macht jeder für sich und da würde ich mir sozusagen eine dauerhafte äh, Zusammenarbeit gerne im Umfeld natürlich unserer Partei, aber auch gerne irgendwie äh, ganz anderen Formen wie hier hier im, im Umfeld der nicht parteinahen Stiftung äh, äh, wünschen, also dass das auf Dauer auch funktioniert. Um, I, th I think I'll talk in English. Um, I, I think there is a, um, a, a mismatch present among the constituents in this room. On the German side we have um, the people who, whose job it is to um, organize big campaigns and who have been telling us about um, mostly represented by your talk this morning, the, the difficulties and <clears throat> if not impossibility of um, um, achieving something through the on first sight rather um, impressive numbers that <clears throat> were gotten out to the street. And as you explained it in one of your answers, you seem to assume that there are basis groups on whose local organizing you are building when you try to put together these big campaigns. And on the American side, we have um, people who are bridging gazillions of tensions and conflicts and problems and building in year-long, if not decade-long, struggle and work um, um, progressive communities that are strong building blocks but who don't have anybody 
up there on top who on occasion and much to your dismay, never come together in any kind of national campaign. So, which they, by the way, occasionally do do. Detroit, Atlanta, um, the various nationwide coalitions. Um, now it seems with every day that even the uh, Washington occupation is um, concentrating lots of um, different nationwide operating groups. Um, but so what are we trying to do here with this mismatch of groups attacking each other, of uh, not doing what the respective other side is or is not doing. Um, Pascal was talking about successful national campaigns. I'm asking, what do you mean by successful? In what way was the campaign successful? What did you mean other than there was a big media echo and um, there were lots of numbers, but did it build anything of the kind of solidarity relationships that the groups assembled here from the United States have actually been building. I mean, I don't know. Why are the base groups that may or may not exist? I mean, I actually I went through my head and tried to think of, is there, do we have an equivalent anywhere in Germany of the Los Angeles Labor Community Strategy Center that has been working for how many years exactly? 22. 22 years, not only regionally, um, but in some instances uh, certainly radiating around and building networks with similar groups in other cities. I don't even think we have anything like this. If you allow me to take your Hamburg Citizens Initiative as something quite typical and representative for stuff that's happening all over Germany, it's rather young. Or the Stuttgart people present, they're rather young organizations that um, um, instrumentalize um, their migrants maybe on Augenhöhe um, as, as was invoked treating them in a way as equals or non-equals. I leave this debated, but it was sort of an instrumentalizing relationship where the migrants use the citizens' initiative because they have contacts to the media, they know how to um, talk, and you use them. Um, not quite clear for what. I'm not even all that sure what is the long-term goal of a citizenship, uh, a citizen's initiative such as yours, other than making some ruckus, uh, which is completely legitimate and very important, but it doesn't seem to me to be a similar type of goal as what Steve's organization and, and Eric and Leanne's organization that are so um, involved in this day-to-day -day, uh, solidarity building across these various tensions that every American city is so characterized by. So I suggest let's acknowledge that for various historic and conjunctural reasons, we are a very motley group uh, thrown together in this room, um, attempting to learn something from each other, but um, we shouldn't pretend that we are really comparable in any way at all, and therefore direct imports and exports are certainly not possible, and um, I'll leave it at that. Let's try to work with that. Yeah, uh, like I said uh, yesterday, I've lived in Germany for four years, so I'm constantly thinking about the US left and the German left and the differences and the reasons for the differences. And I think one thing that, um, I think there are a lot of things about the German left that are, my experience is in the German radical left that, uh, and by that I mean, in G my experience of Germany is that there's people who participate in parties and unions and are organized, and there is the radical left that will not touch those people with a 10-foot pole and organize um, safe, like Freiräume, like free spaces, 
They organize um, people's kitchens, they feed each other, they clothe each other, they take care of each other autonomously. And there's a huge division. Um, and they, the radical left is fantastic at what they do. Like, I have seen demonstrations in Germany of radical leftists where if that happened in the US, everyone would be shot. Like, I literally can't believe what I'm seeing. Um, and I think that's something to celebrate. I think you're right that the left in Germany is like known around the world for its intellectual production. The a number of newspapers and magazines that the radical left produces is unbelievable. And the, the intellectual exchange that's going on is incredible. Um, I think that Germany knows about class. I think that there are 17 year olds that come to the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung and read Das Kapital. There are people that never went to university, never finished high school, that read Adorno and Horkheimer in this country. That's the culture of the radical left, and that's beautiful. Uh, I think the US doesn't talk about class and can't talk about class because we can only talk about race. And that's what we're good at. And that's maybe what we can bring, what American activists can bring to a German context is how to talk about race and how to talk about cultural difference. Um, and I think for this, um, in comparison to this model, this is just my experience, I really don't know if it's true, but my experience of Germany as this incredible separation between parties, organized structures, and autonomous structures. Um, in the US, I think what you have since the 1980s is the total destruction of the welfare state. And that's, a, for me, a huge difference. Like, all of my radical leftist friends live on unemployment money, and with that unemployment money, they do their politics in their free time. That is completely different than what is possible in the United States. Yeah, if you're wondering why you can't get all your friends to show up in the square, that's part of it. <laughs> Um, that's really, I mean, really this is a huge issue and this is a privilege. I recognize that people are precarious when they live on unemployment money in this country, but it's a privilege to have, I'm, I'm not a German citizen, I think now I might qualify for unemployment money, but it's a huge privilege to have unemployment money. It's a huge privilege to be a German citizen. Um, and I think in the US, all of the functions of the state have been outsourced to what we call the nonprofit industrial complex. And the nonprofit industrial complex has a service sector. And I think a lot of these social movements have grown out of a combination of the left and the, the nonprofit industrial complex, where people have been able to take money from foundations, money from the state. The state basically doesn't, I mean, you don't get anything if you live in America and you're a citizen. You get a library card, that's it. Like, I'm not, like, nothing. You have no, this is part of why our border politics are much more open than Europe, because there's less to lose, like we're not paying for people to get unemployment, to get, I mean, food stamps, yes, but that's about it. So I think that's also the issue when we're talking about leadership development, movement building, like what you're also talking about is a nonprofit industrial complex that's well-funded and professionalized. So all of these people here, most of you are paid, I hope not all of you, American activists, some of you are paid, not all of you. Um, but there is a movement that's getting paid to do this. The way they're getting paid is fucked up, they're not getting paid enough, I totally agree that it's problematic. But that's different than parties and then people who are working in their free time for volunteer, on a volunteer basis. Um, and I think another really huge difference for me is, um, is identity politics. Um, I think in uh, I think the example, Christina, that you said this morning about how radical leftists wouldn't show up to support the building of a mosque because they're, they're uh, secular and anti-religion uh, anti is to me a perfect example of the dogmatism and the over-theoretical, the, all of the beef that I have with the, the leftist community in Germany because leftists in Germany are interested in having the right position they're not interested in building human relationships that empower people who are not in power. And that's everything that you guys have been so eloquently and inspiringly talk, talking about the, for the last few days, that people who've been told by the government that they're nothing, ha having the, by the whole system, having them stand up, that that in itself is revolutionary. It doesn't matter what they're standing up for. It doesn't matter. Because in itself, that act is transformative. And I don't think that people, in my experience in the German left, that's not valued. 
That's not important, that's why, and it makes me so angry that my friends won't show up for the building of the mosque because what they're saying is my personal opinions, my political attitudes about religion are more important than empowering the most vulnerable, the most marginalized, the most abused members of my community. And for me, that's, that's where race and culture comes in and I think that's part of what you were saying, Sandolo, is I think one of the fundamental tenets of identity politics in America is that experience is a source of knowledge not books, not theory, experience, lived experience. And I think that, that that's why we keep talking about recognizing people's lived experiences and grow and learning from people's lived experiences. And I think that in Germany it goes, it goes from theory down and I think in the US it goes from lived experience up. Um, and I think this is part of the issue when we're talking about people not being on the same eye level, what you're talking about. Um, it's not just because we have different methods. I think we really have to acknowledge what your question was. Are our visions appropriate or even maybe insulting to the people that we're working with? If I am a uh, believe, I mean, I have some radical leftist friends who are like, I shouldn't have to work. Great, I'm so glad that you have that idea. That's a beautiful idea that you shouldn't have to work. But my God, that is such a privileged and entitled idea and I could only come to that idea by being surrounded by people that don't work and somehow survive by getting employment money, by having money from their family, whatever. It doesn't mean it's a bad idea, it doesn't mean it's a bad vision, but when you go talk to people who are working class and say, hey guys, we shouldn't have to work, that the resonance you're gonna get. <laughs> and I think we really have to take standpoint theory seriously that where we are in a social relationship affects the knowledge that we produce, the way we see the world, what our vision is, what, our, what we believe. And yeah, that's what I would like to see happen more here. Jeez, I keep having to change everything, uh, everything I have to say. Um, so it's interesting. Um, I think for me, uh, one, thank you for that clarification because I feel like um, actually being on the panel was really difficult because I think we're trying to answer different questions and coming in from different experiences. I think the, the conversation around I think part of transformative organizing for me is actually and demonstrating leadership is being able to, at different points, kind of crack the egg open, right? Because I think if we actually are not talking about, it, A, either rigorously trying to clarify what is it that we're trying to do or even name what's happening and what are some of the dynamics, or be able to name some of the complications. Like I feel that there's a, I got so many comments outside trying to, you know, eat my lunch, um, <laughs> about, about some of the conversations that uh, the German folks need to have. Um, because in a lot of ways of either A, you know, whether our facil uh, facilitator should have been a presenter or whether there should have been other folks, you know, invited to talk about these issues or that, you know, and so I think it's, it's in, so I think part of the process is how, and this is what I was talking about earlier, how are we willing to take risks with each other in a way that both A, moves towards clarity, but also doesn't have to feel like we're destroying each other in the process. And I feel for me, that is the great task of our generation and our movements now is how is it that we talk about clearly? What is it that we're trying to do? What is our vision? We may not have the same vision, Right? We may not have, or we may only walk with each other up until a particular point, but how are we clear about that? And does that make you, do I go back and talk shit about you? Or do I go and demean you? Or do I go and you know, do these things? That's the practice that I, I, I'm naming, that the movement is so bad at because we're not actually being honest in the spaces and in the rooms around our own limitations. And I think that to me is a fundamental core of, of an organizer, of a transformative process, is how are we honest about the limitations that our movement has and how are we in a process of learning. And to me, what's interesting is that, you know, I, I, I hope and I aspire to, in our country, we need much mo more coherence. And in my head, it's always been a dream of having a party 
right? And I and that is uh, that's I, I I want to have something that reflects that all of us um, are united around that reflects. But I also know it's not a party of the old type, right? And it's not the party of of what has created great um, injustices and and disservice. And in a lot of ways, being able to claim that you are a revolutionary, that you are a communist, it's almost like I'm more out about being gay and uh, all of these things, radical feminist, but being able to say you're a socialist or a Marxist, it's almost like you say it like you're, you're kind of embarrassed. And I was just like, shit, no, like actually, no. <laughs> this, there is a, an alternative vision. There all have been errors, but it doesn't mean that there's tenets of it that are absolutely correct that I think we need to be in the process of building. And so I think that for, for us, I think that is our limitation. And I started with that at the beginning is like I made a joke about it, is that there's a lot of ways it's like for people in the United States, a huge weakness is that we don't have, and Eric said it earlier, a coherent, um, organization or a formation that then speaks to all of us. And we always make jokes and people say, oh yeah, our members are part of Right to the City, GGJ, the IAD, uh, Vermont Worker Center, and it's like the fucking alphabet soup, you know? And it's like, and they're like, well, what are we a part of? You know, what? I can't even remember all the organizations and alliances I'm a part of. And part of it is, it's, it's all, it, it is the fear. It is the, the, the very fear of committing the errors that I think predecessors have. But I also think we don't give enough for our, ourselves enough credit that I think the people are demanding something bigger than what we are. And I think in the United States, that's the conversation that I think we're beginning to have is that there needs to be a national articulation that has a different vision and that is an alternative. And so I think for me, the questions around cadre or leadership, those words, uh, it's interesting. It's, you know, I think I, I came to age in, in 1989. And for me, there was a lot of our old uh, mentors who were like, the last thing you wanna do is read Marx. The last thing you wanna do is do that. You're going down a road that just is a dead end. And maybe because we were rebels or stubborn or whatever, we're just, or we needed to figure out what, how to make sense of it. For us, it made a lot of sense. And for me, I'm still in the movement because I've utilized it as a, as a tool of analysis. Do I agree with everything? No. Do I agree with everything that grassroots community organizing processes do and the limitations? No. You know? And I, so I think we need to be able to be clear and honest about those things. The other thing is that, to me, the, the, the piece of like where we go and what we do and towards what, I think it's quite honestly, it's a global question. You know, I really look to the movements in Latin America and the, and the new project of socialism for the 21st century. So I think there's a lot to learn. There is a lot to learn from what's happening. It is not perfect. There's a lot of bad things to it, but I do think there is a lot to learn. And I think that some contradictions are being resolved. To have an indigenous president in Bolivia talk about the movement um, uh, against um, the movement for Asia, uh, el, so el socialismo, the party, the mass. Like I was sitting there going, oh my God, an indigenous person and a whole indigenous peoples, and I was in Cochabamba with a whole GGJ delegation, being able to talk about, and, and, and in my own experience back in, in the United States, people basically saying there is no unity between a materialist, a materialist outlook and an idealist outlook. There's absolutely no way that can happen. And then to know, 20 years later be in Cochabamba and be hearing this from indigenous peoples was incredible. So I do think that there's upgrades and there's uh, re, re, uh, sort of reimagining what it could look like that I think is still relevant. So I think for me, the question on the table is, given our conditions, and I think the thing I like about socialism for the 21st century is that it's not a one size fit model. One size, wait, wait, one size, Fit all, fit all model, that I think that ultimately it really says conditions are very different and you have to be able to adapt to what is happening. So then in Bolivia, being able to talk about it as a plurinational state, you're like, oh, what does that mean? 
in the U.S. to talk about a plurinational state may actually make sense because of the well, how we're dealing and the context that we're in. So I just want to say to folks that I, I think it's it's we are having almost like two two simultaneous conversations, but I also feel that they're also complementary, and that you have to be able to because I, I really believe without a base, without actually doing the hard work, without having those difficult conversations and not thinking about vision then we're not doing ourselves or our movements justice. So just want to add to that. Uh, I think that the discussion is very useful for all of us because uh, we don't have the, the whole view. Uh, we have the view of our experience and here we can think also about our field when we exchange experience with, f with others from other fields. But we can have a feedback in our field. So I think it's very useful. And uh, I have an example for this. Uh, one time in a discussion in the World Social Forum, uh, we discussed about uh, migration and uh, racism. And uh, a comrade from Europe said about racism in uh, West Europe and someone from the audience from Africa uh, say that before we talk about racism we have to talk why we have to leave Africa and come in uh, West Europe. So this is the whole view. If you are in West Europe you talk all the time when you talk about immigrants, you talk about racism and xenophobia, and, uh, the, but when you are in Africa, you talk why we don't have to leave our countries. Uh, so this is the, the, uh, the first thing. The second thing that is the question between uh, theory and uh, praxis, uh, and the balance about this. Uh, no one in the left uh, says that when we talk about theory, we have only to talk and not to do anything. <laughs> and uh, no one, I think, that says that when we go for act, this means that we don't think about our act <laughs> but, and only do something. So I think that uh, we have to talk uh, not only for theory and praxis, and, but also for the structures of our alliances, of our parties, or in a, in a point of view of what is the structure that people need and not what is the structure that we want or we feel okay inside. So this is a new question also about leadership. Not if we want someone to lead us or not, but in which way the, are the connections inside the party or inside an alliance and what is the way to be more useful for the people who want to use the party or the alliance or the association. Uh, the third thing is uh, I want to say an example about uh, the work we do in uh, Greece in the field of immigrants. The previous year we had a very big struggle uh, of uh, 300 immigrants that make a hunger strike. It was a very strange struggle because we are in the first year of memorandum of IMF in Greece. Uh, so the most uh, uh, discussable matter is what about the economy and the economic situation of the Greek workers and all this. And you have a big fight of 300 people in the center of uh, Athens. And it's very strange how to, to connect this struggle with uh, uh, the workers, the Greek workers. That uh, you know that the first feeling inside the crisis is that anyone is alone and all the others is opponents. So you have to change this and uh, 
said to Greek workers that we will be uh, in the worst case the next period, but also these people this, all this year are in a very hard situation, so we have to be in solidarity with them. It was very difficult, and it was very strange struggle, but at the end, uh, this tough struggle has uh, 100 of the 300 immigrants in the hospitals. It was after 44 days, and I think that it's the first time that the Greek society talk not about what problem refugees and immigrants make to the Greek society, but what are their problems. Because it was this, the immigrants stand up and said, we cannot be in Sado anymore. And it was this strange fight, it was the first time that changed the view of the Greek society, and at the end, they win, they win the most of the uh, things that uh, fight for. So I think that we cannot uh, have in our minds only a close uh, uh, picture of what is fight, when we fight, how we fight, how we organize it, and what when is the time to organize it? The people uh, comes many times and give fight that you don't know that they will give it. And they make some struggles that they won. And you uh, can uh, be in a room and uh, uh, <laughs> organize with all the little uh, instructions a big struggle in after five years. And when you go there, there's nothing to do. Uh, so we have to be very open to the society, very close to them and uh, the central values of justice, solidarity, and all this have to be our path to the change of the world. Not uh, our specific uh, close uh, schedule uh, of what we have to do. This is only a <laughs> comment. Thank you. I would, if, you, if, you uh, if you allow me, I would like to interject one answer to Patricia that I've been brooding about, about the question if, um, if I feel that, I, that we have been imposing on the people we try to work with or who we try to engage in this, um, in this alliance, and maybe um, my first reflex was to say, no, of course not. But I think there's, um, there's some other question to it, because I mean, I don't feel that we were in the position to impose anything on any, anybody, but... I did, I did not ask, were you imposing your vision? I said, I said, I said, I did not ask, were you proposing, um, imposing your vision? What I asked was, do you understand that your vision may be inappropriate or maybe even be insulting to the people you organize? It's like a question I'm asking before you get there. You know, when you, when you go to meet people, do you realize that what you're thinking may not be at all what they're thinking? And is that okay with you if it is? Okay, I think that would, uh, the answer would be, it depends a little bit, because I think it's not necessarily a bad thing that I bring up something um, somebody else hasn't been thinking about. I, I wouldn't say I know that it's the better way to think, but I don't think that the fact itself has to be insulting, but it, of course it can be. But I was thinking of some, about something else, that one point in this, uh, trying to build this alliance, was that I, we kind of had the feeling that we tried to come up with this transformational well, waves or steps or whatever you call it. And um, a lot of people would agree to uh, the need to defend the workers and the, the need to defend the people from the immediate threats that were going on from, uh, coming out from the uh, crisis and the crisis management. And anything about, beyond that we're up, is up for discussion, of course. And we were trying to um, propose a vision that, um, that says, okay, this crisis has its origins in very different ways of global ways and there's the ecological crisis and the food crisis and we need to come up with some way to build connections with that or otherwise if we 
want to fight the crisis and the crisis management, we will not get to the point of the, of the whole thing. So, but what I was thinking about is, I think the, at the core, I don't know if I made that clear in my talk, at the core there's a conflict of interest that the German workers are not being laid off because they, they or the union basically agree to a low wage strategy so they can compete on the global market. But that has immediate influence on um, the, the standards of living on the whole world. So the question is, who are my people? You know, do I think of the, the you know, it's not because we don't, or my, my practice is, is not, I don't have this community link. So I ha the question is, do I, if I bring in these issues saying, okay, by agreeing to this strategy, you directly uh, worsen the living conditions in this country, in this country, in this country. So uh, this is, of course, a moral point in a way for them. And it's, it's even an insulting because they say, you know, I, I have every right to defend my standard of living and their right too. Of course they are. So this is, this is kind of a dilemma, how to address these different interests and how to, um, to build up solidarity on a global level that is not an insulting and that is um, able to take in the um, totally le legitimate interests of the people living here, but still acknowledging that there's a, um, well, that there, there's kind of an imperial side to that as well. So how, you know, that, is, that was the question, how can we do that? And I don't think we came up with a, with a good answer. And I don't think that the left discussion in Germany at all has some kind of um, answer that, that can take this all in. And I don't think that it, the main problem is that the people do not want to address uh, a systematic question. Because if you look at when people get asked, what do you think is wrong with society? People say all kinds of things. All, everything is wrong. The economy is wrong. The politics are wrong. Everything should be, should be changed. But on the other hand, they don't think it's possible. So they don't think there's, they think it's all wrong, but there's no path to change. So that is, that is it's not necessarily the, the vision that is, um, is insulting them, but it, it, they just don't think it's ever going to work. So, so these are the two points that I wanted to raise. Okay. Well, let me just um, share with you, when we worked, uh, one of the things we were pushing for was closing prisons in, in Illinois. Um, but the people in the rural areas felt that they needed those prisons because those prisons would is, provided jobs for them so they could send their kids to school and build a neighborhood and everything. Well, we talked about it from this perspective. Is it right to build your livelihood on the, on the defeat of another people? The downfall of one people is how you get up. You know, is that how, is that right? And when we use that argument, um, some people were responsive to it, um, but the majority of them in that area where they had the prison population, were not. They were not responsive to it. So we had to change our conversation about is it right for us to pay $250 million a year to house nonviolent offenders in those prisons just so those people could have jobs? You know, or do we need to come up with some other strategy? Well, that brought everybody on our side. No, we're not spending $250 million on that. You know, that money could be spent on our schools or on our housing um, or jobs. But so we had to find an argument that worked with the majority of the people. And that's what you're trying to do, find an argument that works with the majority of the people because sometimes your vision is going to be completely different from other people's vision. One of the things we've been using with our groups, with United Congress groups and the groups that we partner with, and you all probably use this already, is the human rights language. Well, in America, like, they, you try to bring up the human rights language and they say, what, what do you mean human rights? This is America. <laughs> but uh, we use that language to help us build unity so we have something that we agree on. They're building a mosque. We, as a Protestant, I may say that's not important to me that they're building a mosque. But what is important to me is that if people are trying to keep them from building the mosque just because they feel that that's a religion that shouldn't be allowed to advance, then I have a problem with that because I believe that everybody has a right to worship in the way they want to worship. 
And so we talk about it from a human rights perspective to help all of us get on board on issues. Because other than that, the only way we can get on board on the issue is if it's directly impacting us. Um, it's important for us to have a common language. So if you see on the back of this, we have a people's platform. And it talks about the things that we agree on without a doubt, no matter what. And so when it comes to an argument about the guys at the, or, or the young lady, the guys or the guys, girls at the factory, you know, sometimes we have to understand that the collective, for the collective benefit, somehow, sometimes we have to lose a benefit in order for the collective to win. And that's how we've been talking about it, not as an individual uh, group but uh, winning, but all of us winning, because winning alone is delayed failure. It's just a loss that has not surfaced yet. It, we've lost, but it hasn't come to the surface yet. So we use that argument, and we use human rights to bag it up, and that helps us push our agendas through no matter what issue it is, we're able to push them through, and people join in on it. And sometimes some groups opt out, say, I can't be a part of that. Well, fine, the rest of us will. But the majority of times, everybody is on board. Uh, yeah, I want, is it on? Yeah. I want to add some words to the, um, uh, about the German and uh, um, American radical left. I think, uh, I think it's really important to learn from the organization of the American left, but it, it may be important too to understand the reasons why uh, the German radical left is so uh, theoretical and so, so less organized. And in my opinion, this, there are two reasons. First, there is no wish for, for unity, as you said. And, I think it's understandable because um, it may, at some point, uh, have is may important whether for um, for what somebody is standing up. It may be uh, a revolutionary act that somebody is standing up, but if uh, the people using their empowerment to oppress others, it, it may be bad. So I don't want to be solidarity to somebody who who oppresses others. In my opinion, in my view, and the other point is, I think that there is even not the wish to organize itself, because um, lots of people in the radical left see, um, don't want to, to, to grab the power to transform society, because um, we don't want to live in a society where the people are able to change and to rule society which has a power. We don't want to have a society where, where nobody has power and no power is. So um, the, the less um, organization is, in my opinion, grounded and adapts rather like grabbing power to transform is the best way to improve society. Ich möchte davor warnen, sozusagen die Berliner linke radikale Szene als deutsche Linke zu begreifen. Also ich meine, ich, da möchte ich auch noch mal eine Lanze für die Gewerkschaften äh, brechen und auch für die ganzen Leute, mit denen wir tagtäglich zusammenarbeiten. Ne? Die haben vielleicht nicht das, äh, also da müssen, ich, das finde ich eine ganz, ist ein Spezifikum der Berliner Diskussion, dass das immer vergessen wird. Also ich bin jetzt in, in Stuttgart und für mich sind die Leute, die auch gegen Stuttgart 21 auf die Straße gehen, auch wenn sie sozusagen eine Vielfalt von eben Visionen haben, wo das hingehen soll und da gibt es jede Menge Streit drum, ja, also massiv und natürlich muss man sich da einmischen, muss man reingehen und sagen, was bringt es denn, wenn wir jetzt sozusagen das als eine, äh, sozusagen nur als Bürgerbewegung irgendwie ausrufen und gar nicht mehr gucken, was für, ähm, oder wenn wir zum Beispiel nicht gucken würden, was für Jobs da geschaffen werden oder was auch immer, also ich meine, man hat diese inhaltlichen Diskussionen da einfach und das ist für mich die Linke, das zu schaffen, genau das sozusagen lebendig zu halten. Und das, ähm, das, das möchte ich nur noch mal für die ähm, amerikanischen äh, Freunde <lacht> sozusagen mit reingeben. Das ist für mich ein bisschen miss Mismatch. Um, so, <lacht> the last point <lacht> that I, I wanted to make and I guess to connect to maybe some of the threads that have been talked about. Um, you know, I, I don't think that going from experience to theory or from the particular to the general or from the general to the particular, like um, as these extremes, either is what we want, right? And I also don't think that it's a matter of just saying, oh, well, we'll just, you know, perfectly balance them and go down the middle, right? That in every particular circumstance, we're figuring out the, the specific ways that we're going to do it, right? Um, 
And I think that the, um, the, the question for me about transformative organizing is asking about specifically how in this moment, given our different histories, given the specific uh, nature of conditions right now, we're combining those different things. And then we have to be in conversation with each other about the choices that we've made in that combination, right? Um, so even if it's at the, even if it's at a point where we say, well, I'm not going to work with this person around this specific issue because I don't agree with the choices that they've made, I think being able to say that to the other person and be having the courage to say, this is what my position is, right? Um, it creates an opportunity for one us to be able to um, engage our own practices and then come back and say, what happened, <laughs> you know. Um, and, and learn from that. So uh, as I'm hearing more and as the audience gets more into the conversation and people get a little upset, um, <laughs> it's, I've actually seen more similarities <laughs> um, <laughs> between, <laughs> between the US and, and Germany, right? Um, uh, and get a little bit more familiar with the language. But um, I think for me, the I wanted to touch on the question of power um, because for me, like it's it, w the radical left, which I think in our context, we would generally talk about more as like anarchist folks who are saying like, we don't want to seize power, right? We want power to be dispersed. Um, is, is, was part of a lot of how I got formed. I was formed around that energy a lot. Um, and I think the particular moment that uh, the U.S. left is in um, is in some ways, uh, from my perspective, a result of people, a, a good number of people coming from that perspective and running into barriers or not being able to accomplish what they themselves wanted. Whatever from somebody who said they were wrong, right? From their own internal perspective, they're saying, I'm trying to do something and I'm not getting there, right? Um, and so I think some of the challenges that we've been centering, particularly around uh, how are we bringing this transformative vision or how are we building up uh, cadre or to use a different term, responsibles, right? Like how are we building up these folks um, is the result of folks running into barriers in the work, right? Um, and it seems that as folks are talking about the German context, um, if the problem is or that the barrier that people are running up against isn't that they've been doing very specific issue-based organizing for long decades and they keep running into these problems, right? But it's more that they've been having great conversations about specific positions, but they haven't necessarily felt that they've been able to build relationships with the, the sectors and the classes that they want to, then those are, those are different challenges. But I think what seems uh, similar is that, to me, both are asking about how are we combining uh, our thinking and our action, right, in order, in my perspective, to build power. And power isn't merely like how do we get a position within a government, uh, in a government structure, right? Power isn't merely uh, having an organization that has a membership. Right? Power isn't just uh, having the right position, right? Um, but in each of these moments, how are we combining all of these aspects that's actually able to give folks who are oppressed the sense that it's possible to transform um, and it's possible for a different society to, to come into existence and they themselves are the actors of that, right? Um, and so for us, like, well, I should say, my perspective on, on the work that we do um, transformative organizing uh, in our daily struggles about things is about building that power and right there in that circumstance, in those new combinations, thinking about our history, um, we're building the power that we want to see. Eigentlich schade. Ich würde gerne direkt da anknüpfen, weil mir das ganz gut gefallen hat gerade. Aber das, was ich sagen wollte, war ja noch mal ein Nachtrag zu einer anderen Frage, die uh der Vertreter der Linken aufgebracht hat, und zwar, ob nur das lokale Ort sein kann, um, um Konflikte sichtbar zu machen und 
da kommt jetzt die äh, Verbindung zu dem, was du gesagt hast, um die Machtfrage zu stellen äh, und wie es eigentlich aussieht mit der Verbindung von Kampagnen und Organisierung. Und mir ist ein Beispiel eingefallen, nämlich gerade die aktuelle Kampagne, das Recht auf Stadtbündnisses in Hamburg, das ist Mietenwahnsinn stoppen, Wohnraum vergesellschaften ist das Motto und äh, es geht darum, einmal ein breites, möglichst breites Bündnis hinzubekommen, was sich unter diese Forderungen stellt und was kontinuierlich arbeitet und ganz konkret eine große Demonstration zu machen, wenn der Mietenspiegel herauskommt, das heißt, wenn systematisch die Mieten in Hamburg erneut angehoben werden. Das heißt, was damit passieren soll, ist, dass einmal äh, reagiert wird auf die Situation in ständig steigender Mieten in Hamburg bei stagnierenden bzw. fallenden Löhnen und auch gleichzeitig eine Lösung anzubieten, nämlich Wohnraum dem Markt zu entziehen, zu vergesellschaften in Mieterhand, durch welche Lösungen auch immer. Das wäre jetzt noch nicht so das Besondere, also diese Demonstration wird groß werden, sie wird auf jeden Fall wahrgenommen werden, weil eben der Mietenspiegel herauskommt, die Mieten angehoben werden, der, der Schock da sein wird. Äh, auch möglicherweise wird diese radikale Forderung Wohnraum für Gesellschaften in der Öffentlichkeit aufgenommen werden, möglicherweise wird darüber berichtet werden, das heißt es öffnet sich möglicherweise ein diskursives Fenster, dass man äh, Marktdynamik, Marktlogik hinterfragen kann auch. Aber das wirklich Besondere an der Geschichte ist, dass es in drei Stadtteilen, unter anderem auch in meinem, äh, regionale Veranstaltungen geben wird, wo es direkt darum gehen wird, diese Forderung Wohnraum vergesellschaften, Mietenwahnsinn stoppen, auf lokale Ebene herunterzubrechen. Also in Wilhelmsburg wird das direkt verknüpft werden mit den, was wir gesehen haben, mit dieser Mobilisierung zu den Sozialbaublocks, zu den Gagvorhäusern. Bei uns in Altona wird es ein bisschen anders aussehen noch, aber wir werden direkt auf lokale äh, Probleme reagieren, auf pro lokale Probleme, die die Menschen haben mit einzelnen Vermietern und da aufzeigen, warum da äh, äh, eigentlich es notwendig ist, Wohnraum zu vergesellschaften, dem Markt zu entziehen. Das wird trotzdem natürlich nicht, und deswegen, man geht in keinen Kampf, den man dann gewinnen kann. Es wird nicht unmittelbar dazu kommen, dass die Häuser enteignet werden. Es wird auch weiterhin darum, darum gehen müssen, dass man sich gegen einzelne Mieter wehrt, vielleicht kollektive Formen der Mietminderung findet und so weiter. Aber es wird sozusagen ein Fenster geöffnet haben, auch weiter zu denken, um wirklich strukturelle Lösungen zu finden für strukturelle Probleme. Das fiel mir noch so ein, das war wichtig nochmal nachzutragen, denke ich, als Beispiel, was hier auch möglich ist in dieser Verbindung. Okay, thank you very much and thank you all for these two and a half, I don't know how long it was, <laughs> days and hours and days.